is started and verbal confirmation provided when we are broadcasting. Thank you. Welcome to this meeting of the Children and Young People Scrutiny Committee. The agenda papers and other relevant information for this meeting are available for public viewing on the Herefordshire Council website. The Council is streamlining this meeting live on the Herefordshire Council YouTube channel and also making a recording. The recording will be available via the Council's website shortly after the meeting has concluded. Other attendees are permitted to film, photograph and record our public meeting, providing that it does not disrupt the business of the meeting. If you do not wish to film or photograph, please identify yourself so anyone who tends to record the meeting can be made aware. Is anyone here who does not wish to be filmed? Thank you. To ensure that recording quality is maintained, could members please speak as clearly as possible and keep background noise to a minimum and ensure that mobile phones and other devices are turned to silent. And I'll turn the microphone on because you can probably hear me better at the end if I do. So welcome to everybody. We have some members of the committee joining us remotely today, so I will now ask them to confirm they can hear us and check we can hear them. Um, Councillor Tony Fagan, can you hear and see us? Yes, good afternoon, Chair. I can hear you, thank you, and thanks for letting me attend remotely. Thanks for joining us. And Councillor Hanson, I know you're not very well, so thanks for joining us remotely. Hope you can hear and see us okay. Yes, I can hear and see you, thank you. I'm just a few de degrees under. So I understand, hope you get much better soon. And one of our co-optees, Mr Andy James, I understand you were joining us remotely as well. Can you see and hear us? Yes, Chair, I can hear and see you clearly. Thank you very much. Any members of the committee or co-optees with voting rights who join the meeting remotely, it's reminded, are not able to vote in resolution of the committee, but they may otherwise participate in the debate. We have other members, other people joining us, not members of joining us remotely today. Ruth Whittingham, I can see you there, Head of Law and Legal Business, Partner, Children and Families. Can you hear us okay, Ruth? I can, yes. Thank you. I know Councillor Diana Tyngray, the uh, lead member, is joining us. I'm not sure if you're here yet, Diana. Are you? Can you hear us? Not yet. Okay, she will be joining us shortly. Sends her apologies if she's late. Uh, Councillor Kath Hay, you're joining us as somebody with a special interest in this subject. Can you hear and see us okay, Kath? Yes, I can. Thanks, Chair. I can see and hear you. Thank you. We have Matt Pierce, Director of Public Health Community. Can you hear and see us okay, Matt? Apologies, Matt's not with us today. Um, I'm here, Rebecca R. James, Consultant Public Health. Oh, sorry. What was your name, sorry? Rebecca Hal Jones. Okay. Oh, yeah, Rebecca. Oh, sorry. Right. Yes, okay. Got that. Thank you. I was going to introduce you separately, but now you've introduced yourself. Thanks. And Lindsay McCarty, Public Health Specialist. Can you hear and see us, Lindsay? I can see and hear you. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you. We also have Jenny Dalloway, the lead for Mental Health Children's and Maternity. Can you hear and see us, Jenny? Uh, Jenny's had to give her apologies, I'm afraid. Uh, I'm here in her stead. My name is Jack Wainwright. I'm mental health lead at the CCG. So what was your name again? Jack Wainwright. Okay. Thanks, Jack. That's in place of Jenny. Looking over that. Thank you. And Sally on Osborne, Associate Director, Head of the Church and Worcester Health and Care NHS Trust. Can you see and hear us, Sally Ann? Yes, I can. Uh, see and hear you. Thanks a lot. And we also have Elaine Cook Tippins, Clinical Services Manager for CAMS. Can you hear and see us okay, Elaine? Yes, I can. Great, thank you. In the room, I have myself, Councillor Howells as Chair, Councillor Hewitt as Vice Chair, Councillor Summers, and Councillor Kenyon. And we are expecting Councillor Andrews to join us shortly. He certainly did apologise, he may be a little bit late. I was expecting Councillor Jones. Have we heard? Come up from Councillor Jones. I mean, normally he is very punctilious about telling us. I uh, hope he's okay. So we may see him later. We just don't know the moment. Also in the room, we welcome Matthew Sampson, Interim Assistant Director, Children's Safeguarding, Quality and Improvement. Nice to see you join us, Matthew. We have James Kempton, who is LGA Mentoring Support for myself and Jenny as Chair and Vice Chair. And you might be seeing a pretty scorecards as we go along during the meeting to see how well he thinks we're doing. But we've learned a lot from you already, James, and hope we deliver on some of the learnings during this meeting. 
We also, I think, have, well, not with us, but probably online, Victor Darren, the Archdiocese of Cardiff nomination. I think he knows Observer. Are you there, Victor? If so, can you hear us and see us? Not there? Okay, we were expecting him. I think that, no, not doesn't quite have cover everybody. Sorry, missing out two very important democratic support services people. Uh, three, in fact, John Coleman, Democratic Services Manager. Um, James Vickery, Democratic Services Officer, observing and in training. And jointly, you're both going to produce uh, the notes and have been very helpful in putting the agenda together. Gentlemen, thank you. It's a complex agenda, so I appreciated the support you, you gave in doing that. Jen Priest, Avery Managing, our recording, etc. at the top end there. Thanks for joining us as ever, Jen. And I've got Michael Carr down here. Is Michael joining us or not? Yes, good afternoon, Chair. Are you remote? online? Today. Oh, great, okay. Great. Yeah, we've also got Councillor Toynbee as well now, she's joined us. Sorry? Councillor Toynbee's also just joined us. Oh, you just joined us, Councillor Toynbee. Yes, hi, um, sorry I'm late. Yes, thanks um, Thanks for having me. I can see you and hear you. Great, I did say you might be a few minutes, few minutes late, but you've joined us perfectly in time. Sorry. Here we've also got Kerry Morgan, Assistant Director of Threat. Great, all right, right. Online. Online. Okay, you'll we'll probably be joined. Is he remotely as well? He's I can there. see you right in the middle there, Kerry. Yes, yep. I was going Hello. to ask the question, but thanks for reminding me, Matthew. You can see us, hear us, um, yeah. see and hear us, I'm sure. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I can see and hear you. Thanks very much. All right. I'm not sure if I've... I don't think I've missed anybody. Anybody feel they're not being introduced? Great, thank Afternoon, you. Afternoon, Chair. I'm Andrew Teal. Hello. I'm Andrew Teal. I'm standing in for Sam Prattley from the Diocese of Hereford. Oh, hello, Andrew. Okay. Great. That's good to see you. Thank you very much for letting me know you're here. And then you can hear and see us. And now we've been joined by Councillor Mike Jones. Welcome, Mike. Thank you. Sorry, I'm late. Uh, you made it. Apologies for absence, Clark. Do we have any apologies for absence? I know it's a Sam Prattley, but we have a stand in. And uh, Jane Ellis, Director of Healthcare. Yeah, we've just got Hilary Jones. Who's Hilary Jones? Hilary Jones. Hilary. Hi. Yes, Hilary Jones. I'm principal casement manager for the SEN team. Great, thank you. Matthew, I'm going to remind you you want to speak to me. I, I, I knew that. But, um, apologies from Daryl Freeman, Director of Children's Services. Apologies from who, sorry? Daryl Freeman. Daryl? Yes, of course. Noticeable by not being here. I was hoping to be, but thank you. We'll note that. Have we covered everybody? I know apologies. Daryl, on Zoom. Yeah. Um, we've got an Emmy, Emmy Garner and a Joanna Chick that have put their hands oh. up. I'm not sure if anyone <laughs> Is anybody remotely online that we haven't spoken to well could be right to introduce themselves? Okay, great. We have a great attendance. Thank you. Did sure. You this is, yeah, this is the second time Daryl hasn't been here. Is there uh, some good reasons why he hasn't attended? He was at the last meeting. No, he wasn't. Okay, he was. He was there. I asked yeah. him a couple of questions. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I thought he wasn't. No, he was. He was with him because yeah. he was alongside you, Matthew. Correct. Yeah. Last yeah. yeah. meeting. So I'm sure there are very good reasons. His sentence apology. We can certainly ask David. Okay. Name substitutes. Well, we've had those. Thank you very much. Any declarations of interest? To receive any declarations of interest by members in respect to items on the agenda. Are there any members who wish to declare any interest? Either schedule one, schedule two or other interest in anything on today's agenda. Okay, no one, thank you. Item four minutes. To approve and sign the minutes of the meeting held on 22nd of February 2022. I've had no notice of any accuracy. Have you, James or John? No. So can I take it that the minutes of 22nd of February 2022 are approved, please? Can those who are in the room or working members raise your hands if you're for? Jane, you for? Sorry. Anyone against? No abstentions. That's passed then. Thank you. We want to look at, although it's, it's actually at the end of the programme, the agenda, according to the papers, we did agree at the last meeting and in the workshop we had beforehand, the planning workshop, 
that we would bring the action and recommendation tracker to the front immediately after the minute so we can double check that the actions we've agreed are in the process of being undertaken. So are there any points any members would like to raise about the action tracker that we should be highlighting? Or any comments from cabinet members or officers present? What's the page? Can you just remind everybody what the page on the action tracker is? It's right at the end page. I've got page 17. Are members just aware of it? Have you looked at it? Do you want me to come bring it back later? Have you looked at it later? We did say you'd bring it forward. Yes, but let's just get the page and then we can move on the page. Chairman, who did you say that to? Because obviously uh, I'm going off the Sorry, I've got I'm just, me. sorry, I was just asking for the page that we're looking at. Can anybody help me, please? Councillor Kenyon, while we're looking, what did you say? I didn't hear what you said. Um, you may want well to brought this forward, but you haven't told anyone you brought it forward. I wasn't in the last meeting, so I'm going off the agenda I've got in front of me. Can we just stop keep to the agenda? I'm happy to put it back. We did say at the last meeting we'd always bring it after the minutes and we agreed in the work programme we would, but you're quite right, it doesn't have to we'll say something on the stick agenda. It, stick it just after the minutes then. You know, don't leave it at the end of the agenda. We'll make sure it does next time. Take your point and we will do it correctly next time and we'll bring it at the end. Okay, good point, Grace. Thank you. I'd like to add, before we go any further, additional notes about the co op tees. It'd be good to update the committee on the action points on that. In the last minutes, we did note that two co op tees have been considered. First of all, as I said earlier, we welcome the co op tee that's been nominated by the Archdiocese of Cardiff, Mr. Victor Darron. Uh, he did say he'd be joining us as an observer today, but he should be able to join us in for, um, as a full member at the introduction at the next meeting on the 26th of March. In addition, you may remember <coughs> we've agreed that we would recruit and adopt a, a parents cooperative member. And the update on that is we have interviewed candidates on behalf of um, the, the committee. We have made recommendations to legal on which of the people we interviewed we would like to see co-opted as a uh, the parents member. But that process still has to be completed and to be inducted and hopefully they'll be able to attend the next meeting as a full member but we have to get legal's confirmation that a recommendation can be enacted and b that they can go through the induction before the next meeting am i correct in saying that um, i think i think it would probably be more accurate to say that the committee will need to agree the co-opted member at the next meeting yes yes okay and then yep. uh, the rest will as you described happen after that great thank you we did ask for that advice earlier on so Thank you for confirming that. So now we come on to item five, questions from members of the public. No questions received from the public. So we can move on to item six, questions from members of the council. And again, we've received no questions from councillors. So we can move on to item seven. And the first of two items that are the purpose of this meeting. And I just want to say a few words of introduction before we actually go into the the two items. First of all, this is our very first Children and Young Persons Scrutiny Committee meeting that addresses and is devoted to the issue of mental health issues affecting our young people. We all know it's a, an extremely serious matter. So first of all, what I'd like to say first of all, we've had a great workshop this morning. As is our practice, we hold introductory workshops before these committee meetings and it's been very helpful in getting members updated as much as possible on the background to the arrangements that we're debating. We had 18 people on that workshop, so that was a great commitment from everybody. And I'd like to say thanks so much for the enthusiasm, the obvious professionalism and commitment of the officers who delivered presentations at the workshop this morning. There were quite a number of them. It took quite some time to squeeze into two hours, but it was really very informative and helpful. So thank you all very much for the hard work you did. Very few short notice in putting those reports together for us. And similarly, thanks very much to the presenter of this meeting. Similarly, Daryl and his team who equally have worked very hard to put together an agenda for this meeting. And actually it was quite difficult to devise an agenda because as we all know, mental health in young people, or mental health for the whole community, never mind young people, but we're looking at young people is very much a growing area of concern to everybody. We just couldn't address everything in this meeting clearly and all matters to do with mental health. So what we decided to do was try and look at two particular areas to try and get us an overall view of the, the range of services that could be offered 
to help young people manage on their mental health issues, and also to look at, in particular, the issues of mental health in primary schools and compare those to mental health issues in secondary schools, and were there any differences that could be particularly identified and they might therefore necessitate a different approach. And what I'd like to ask members to do, as part of the learning from our mentoring, is when we are listening to the reports and what you've heard this morning, is not just to come forward with recommendations, but in particular to look at the bigger picture. Are we actually aware and do we believe that the council is addressing and has got a grip on tackling the whole subject of mental health as a whole? If not, or if we do agree, even, there will still be gaps. So I try to identify what those gaps are, and some of those were quite pointedly made to us this morning in the workshop in specific areas. Are they being addressed, and how are they being addressed, and do we think they're being addressed adequately? And are we satisfied with that? And probably more particularly, as we can help in scrutiny, what are the barriers to addressing those gaps that we might be able to help with as part of our scrutiny work? And when we look on children, primary versus the adolescence aspect of mental health, are there any differences between the two mental health profiles that we can, as scrutiny, help with? Is this comparable to our statistical neighbours? I'm not sure if we're getting that evidence today, but it is something we should certainly be asking as something in the future. And is the work that needs to be done reflected in the resource allocation? And if we had more money, what could we do with it? And if we have to make savings, what would the priorities be? So that's quite a lot, but hopefully give members a view of taking the bigger picture of what it is we should be thinking about when we hear in the reports from the, the offices concerned. So the first one is the impact of the pandemic on the mental health and well-being of pupils in schools. Those are pages 19 to 48 in your pack. And it's the report to the committee on the impact of the pandemic on the mental health and well-being of children in our education system. And I'd like to invite Kelly Morgan, Assistant Director, Education, Development and Skills. I believe you're introducing it for us, Kelly. Thank you, Chair. Um, thanks, everybody. Um, just by way of an apology to start with, folks, we actually sent out two slideshows. Uh, we sent both of them out. They, you, the latter one is the one. There's very little difference between the two. But what we've tried to do is stitch together various partner agencies to talk about the kind of broad picture here. And in the putting together of the big slideshow, um, different people will speak to different parts of it. We ended up sending you out two versions at the end of the day rather than one. It's the pink and purple set that is the real one. But so, And I'd like to thank you for your patience with that and also with the governance team who kind of corrected it. And I'm hoping you've had both really. They are they are not very different actually, folks. It was just a final version control thing. So apologies for that from me. So Kerry, um, just to confirm, that's the supplementary paper, which is pages three to 22, that's correct. Yeah, that's correct, that's correct. Yes, that's, that's right. Um, and just by way of introduction, and then we'll get, move to the slideshow after I've spoken for five minutes or so, if I may, is uh, is to say we were asked we were asked to write a paper on the impact of the pandemic on the mental health and well-being of children in schools. We actually extended it slightly so that it was preschool age children as well, and I'll explain why we did that in a minute, uh, because actually we are really worried about the impact of the pandemic on nursery and preschool children. And we have on the call today Emily Garner, who leads on that area, so she. She will want to talk in some detail about bits of that when we get to that part. Um, but I'd like to explain why the paper was structured the way it was, if I may. Um, it's, be it's because, although it's tempting to think that it's a sort of post-pandemic period, it's anything but that in schools at the moment. Since Christmas, schools have probably been busier with pandemic management issues than they ever have been throughout the last two years. It's been a fairly brutal workload for school leaders in particular and school teachers. And, and it's also been completely volatile in terms of absences still. So we're definitely not in a post-pandemic phase in schools. It's still pretty full on out there. And I wanted to take a little bit of time on the paper to just put that in context. So the first section or two on the paper really reminds us all what, what's happened in the last two years, because it's tempting to forget that um, what's happened um, in the last two years. It's still very lively. Um, it's still very operational out there. And it's 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 not we don't see the serious illnesses that we saw in the early stages but we still see the changes the volatility in attendance for example um, so there's an introductory phase which i called the contextual background and then we try to structure the report in terms of the ages of the children so the first section is preschool 
the second section is largely primary and secondary. We, we, we lumped together because the, the teachers and the head teachers in the primary and the secondary sector are giving us very similar pictures about how they see the differences in children's behaviors. Um, we then tried to look a little bit about the different cohorts of children that have been affected uh, differently. Um, and by cohorts, I mean age ranges and also particular groups. So for example, disadvantaged children, um, children with special educational needs and vulnerable children and the impact of the pandemic on those are separate cohorts. And then I tried to pick out the key themes in it really. One is around the changes to the behavior of children, which very loosely can be captured in, in the phrase less resilient. So they're quicker to tears and anger and um, less comfortable with what you and I might recognize as the kind of routine um, rhythm of school life generally. Uh, they've also been a subsequent consequent knock on for attendance. Uh, but just to be clear about that, actually Herefordshire has consistently performed above national and certainly well above national in terms of comparisons to the regional attendance records throughout the pandemic. But that's not to say it's as good as it was pre-pandemic. So we've done well, but we've got some, some concerns about getting more children to attend more regularly than was the case. There's also been a, a minor kind of knock-on consequence for a, a spike in exclusions and temporary exclusions, which we now call suspensions again, uh, which I'll talk to briefly. And of course, we've only got one, where that leads you to is we've only got one special uh, school which deals with social, emotional, mental health um, issues, which is Brookfield School. And in the workshop this morning, we had the head of Brookfield School, Michelle Parks, who may well join us chair during the meeting. She's actually in school at the moment running the school. So we've invited her. She may well be able to join us later to talk about that. Um, and then a few suggestions about what we what we think we can do or are already doing about some of these. What the report is not, though, is a consistent methodology uh, because it's been so. And by that, I mean, because it's been so difficult in, in terms of staffing schools since Christmas, I couldn't bring myself to send out surveys and questionnaires to them. They're, they're too busy. So we've taken a kind of case study approach to this report, which means I phoned people, asked them for their comments and taken those into consideration. But it was pretty clear pretty early on exactly what the emerging issues are. And I've kind of characterized. So it's not a it's not a systematic methodology for report. And I'd like to suggest at some point, say, six months further down the line, we have a fresh look at this in a more methodical way. And by then I'm expecting some of the national survey material to start coming in as well around the same issues, which we can feed into. Um, in essence, what are we seeing post pandemic? Um, which year groups have been um, most impacted according to the views of the schools? Preschool children, particularly, particularly children aged between two and four years old. And that's partly because if you look at how short their little lives have been so far, for some of those children, nearly all of it has not been typical. Most of their life have been during the pandemic. And the main issue for that is a lack of kind of readiness for preschool nursery settings and also a, a speech and language delay when they've spent nearly two years not being able to interact with children of their own age in the way you might normally get. And the speech and language delay for children of that age is quite a profound delay on socialization as well. So the behavior, the resilience of those children is different. We also think, and the DfE have just, just this week, actually, since the papers were published, released a, a mini survey of their own, which identifies year one pupils in, um, in schools as the most significantly impacted by the pandemic. And that's because they've started a semi-formalized curriculum, but it's brand new to them. And they themselves have had a, a, a kind of speech and language delay, and that's proving to be a struggle. And, um, and so the year one, year group has been identified by the DfE as a focus group for the future. I would actually add year two into that as well. In year two, which is what we were used to call top infants, um, there's a slight, there's an approach to a slightly more formalized curriculum there and the move from an informal curriculum to a formal curriculum when you've got a speech and language delay, when you've not been used to the rhythm of school for two years is proving a challenge to children. So there's a spike in what you might describe as emotionally challenging behavior in children as young as that, which we wouldn't necessarily have seen pre-pandemic. So, so preschool and very young children in school have shown or exhibited more frequently a kind of less resilient approach to curriculum um, than you might otherwise expect. That 
you can see threads of that throughout all of the age range, but we also see it spike again in year seven because that's the move from primary into secondary and the year seven curriculum is more formalized, of course, and those children missed out on their transition activities during the pandemic. So there's a spike in behavioral issues in year seven, um, largely driven by a, the same issues really, linguistic delay, emotional delay, and um, a struggle with a slightly more formalized curriculum, as I say. And then the final year group we've identified will be any child, any child that's had any kind of connection with GCSE coursework, whether they finished their GCSEs and gone on to kind of post-16 profession or whether they're just entering it. The whole uncertainty around the GCSE curriculum and the examination requirements and the timetabling and the online passages at home have meant that those children have had a significantly disrupted approach to the end of their formal schooling. And by formal, I mean up to age 16. So there's been a significant impact there. And I'm hoping to have conveyed in a bit of the report um, something about the impact on children from disadvantaged backgrounds. And we know, we, we, we knew already actually, that youngsters from disadvantaged backgrounds, there's a significant gap between their performance and the performance of all children nationally, which we did see in Herefordshire pre-pandemic. That gap has widened during the pandemic. So there's a significant extra issue of, arisen for us, which is how do we close the gap with disadvantaged children? And the reasons behind that gap widening are multiple, but largely, largely disadvantaged children, when we moved online, for example, they spent less time online than their peers from more advantaged homes. So the gap widened for that reason when we were in the online period, and they were less engaged with some of the curriculum initiatives that schools were, were doing when they came back post, when they came back from the pandemic. Um, and the same message about children with special educational needs and some of the slides are specific to SEND and so Hillary, I'm delighted that Hilary Jones is with us this afternoon because she can talk to some of those slides for us about the specifics of that. So it's, it's a bleak picture. Behaviour is uh, more volatile in every sense of the word. Schools are struggling with the management of some of that. Um, they're actually doing pretty well at it but there has been a rise in exclusions and exclusions or temporary exclusions for very young children. Um, that means we've reached capacity in our one special school, Brookfield, for that kind of provision. So there's a structural problem we face now, which is we're full in that school, largely. So we're having conversations about a kind of Brookfield too. Um, there are complications about that. It's not straightforward because if you were to open a Brookfield 2, it would probably fill up almost immediately and you'd still have a queue as well. So we're looking at outreach work in mainstream settings with Brookfield specialist input um, as a priority. And then the issue around attendance. The issue around attendance is, is, as I say, we've actually done very well in terms of attendance locally throughout the pandemic. Um, the DfE have, have launched an attendance officer initiative because that's a national issue, it's not just local. Um, but they've made the assumption that local authorities have attendance officers. Well, we don't. We used to years ago, but they went. So we're looking at whether we could reinvent that role. Um, I don't know that the title attendance officer is very appropriate now, but some kind of, I don't know, being school advisor or something that we could use, which means we could engage with the DfE initiatives. Um, and, and, and there's a suggestion that um, as we navigate the kind of post-pandemic period, we, we, kind of, we kind of look to appoint a mental well-being champion in all of our schools, particularly the primary schools, if I'm honest. Some schools do have such posts already. They've already appointed these, so the title will vary from school to school. And I've set up a small head teacher reference group to look at all of these issues. We have not yet met, um, but I've got the group formed now. Um, and then there's, there's likely to be I hope some more um, central government funding coming because if you remember post pandemic there was a kind of catch up program and the, the, the catch up czar so Tim Coulson resigned if you remember because he didn't think the funding was there. We think the DfE are beginning to recognize that although they can't fund it in the way he wanted they, they haven't yet been able to fund it so we're not asking for money from you at this point um, folk because the resources are likely to be found kind of around what we've got already, but we're asking for an understanding about the changing challenges and priorities. Does that make sense? And then finally from me, in the room, you'll have an awful lot of expertise from different agencies, partners, health, public health, NHS, and the plan is to talk through those slides in order and ask, ask there any questions we can as they come up. 
so that's that's my introduction folks so um if i hand back to you chair i'm happy to take any questions on that or about the report itself thank you okay. Terry. And yeah. i know you've done this a joint presentation with with uh, the council and the director and head of the chair was the CC, ccg but you're presenting on behalf of both the council and we haven't got a ccg representative have we Just specifically and we've got the nhs trust so am I right thinking you're presenting on behalf of both? Um, no, I'm, I'm doing the schools bit. Actually, on the slideshow, people yeah. will take us through each of their own slides, if that makes oh, sense. Okay. And, and that's where the duplication came from, Chair, because we lost version control, trying to stitch it all together right at the last minute. So apologies for that. Well, also apologies for understanding. You did substitute at <laughs> the very last minute, so we're all learning exactly what we have in front of us. So yes, over to members to ask any questions. David, you want to ask one? Thank you, Chair. Uh, would you say that we were ill prepared for issues attached to early learning? And if, as I think we were, do you believe that uh, things will improve in the future? Because early learning has always been seen to be on the back seat. Suddenly, we've gone from zero to five, which was was a non-entity a few years ago. Now we're suddenly there, which is great. It's, but yeah. it's taken a, a lot of uh, PR to get there. And I would hope that uh, we will see things improve in the future. Do you see? Do you see a chance at that? Thank um, you. I, I, thank you, Councillor. I do. I do see that. I do think there's a temptation to treat early years provision as a bit of a Cinderella service. So to answer your question, were we well prepared? I think actually we we have done well in that. Were we well prepared for the pandemic? Resources were pretty stretched when the pandemic arrived. I would say, and in fact, I was reminding folk this morning that in fact, in that first year of the pandemic. Out of 180 or so nurseries, half of them closed almost within a week. So it became very operational, keeping the service open around the county, which we did. Um, do I see it? Do I see it recovering? I would suggest that the kind of uh, that's one of the two big priorities that have now landed with us. So I'm hoping we can improve the service in that by but we are very stretched capacity wise. I would say we do need more support in terms of provision for preschool education in its broadest sense and by extra support that might mean advisory support or it might mean um, helping nurseries or preschool settings actually manage their business model slightly better than they might do so we can get greater efficiencies that way i think we do have a little more help that came in before covid and there were a few things that came in before covid that were really recognized covid maybe made it more recognizable but we have perinatal we have psychiatrists in perinatal which takes care of zero years etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, one of the things i've seemed to have noticed is that we don't have that much communication with them and i'm wondering if we if we are going to get more communication with the money the there was quite a bit of funding came into perinatal but we seem to be not getting much out of it as far as the council is concerned can you give me some answers on that one thank you um, I might I might bring Emily, my colleague, in at that point because of the communication. There is communication between, with perinatal and the preschool settings. What I don't know is how effective that communication has been pre-pandemic. I don't know whether Emily. I don't mean to put you on the spot. Whether whether you can um, put a bit of detail into the question reply. Well, I was hoping Lindsay might just jump oh, in at Lindsay, this point. Okay, we do we might. do have we have partnership meetings where we share information and perinatal. I think appear there. Is that right, Lindsay? Um, <coughs> yes sorry trying to undo undo my things um and um our health services um also have very strong links with pronatal service and hannah bannister white uh, is here this afternoon so if there are any detailed questions around that uh, hopefully hannah will be able to answer but there are very close relationships i suppose what we don't do is talk very much about about those um but 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 certainly yeah the the, the links are there Two questions, Councillor Summers. For now, thank you. Yeah, okay. For now. Yeah. Councillor Hugh, would you like to follow up on that? Oh. And I, I can see you had a Councillor Fagan come back to you in a second. Councillor Fagan. Councillor Fagan. Councillor, actually, you were you were next, Councillor Kenyon. Sorry, I missed out. Thank you. You can't forget me very easily. Um, no, it's great to see so many um, experts. I call you experts over there and um, I've got a few questions and I've got a few observations. If you think it's your brief, pick up on it, please, and try and answer them as we go. 
Um, I'd like to kick off with um, what are the current waiting times for referrals for children with mental health? So they've been picked up in the schools. Uh, that's the first and not the referral times before they... We can't hear you very well, sorry. Perhaps. So yeah. what are the referral times for children that are picked up in the schools um, by these teams that are going out? Um, as the, as the, have the schools been offered any additional training to look for it? Because I, I, I do know that pastoral care is very, very important in schools. And it's also the thing that's cut from budgets when budgets are tight. Um, so has any additional training or um, offers of support gone to schools over and above the health of team that's, that's going around the secondary schools? Uh, there was no mention of primary schools. Um, is there any COVID recovery money from government that can be put towards this obviously the increase in mental health within young people and children? Um, has there been any additional monies? Because there seems to be all sorts of COVID recovery pots flying around. Are we looking at them? Are we tapping into them? Uh, yeah, there, there was another one there. To, uh, rather than percentages and that sort of stuff, how many, how many children have been affected? You know, how many additional children have been affected from the norm? That's another question. And I've, I'm just sort of reading through the talk community and that sort of stuff. Um, I'd like to make a point about uh, Black Marston School and Bar School School are two excellent schools and this to do with the SENS and that sort of stuff and they have got support groups in there and this and I think the schools are excellent I've been to both of them, my daughter attends one of them um, my one concern is homeschooling um, these ch children that are homeschooled how are we checking these to make sure they're getting all the support that we need you know so so the school system and let's um, for the time being, oh, oh yeah, um, Riverside School, I know, in Hereford, I mean, they do some great work there, I've attended that school. Uh, on occasion, they'll send their TAs out to go and pick up children from school, uh, from, from their homes, and they'll feed them when they get into school. They go that far, and I think that's a superb way of doing things, and it's the best practice. And um, what other schools do that, or take those steps to actually go to children's houses um, and, and help them into school? Um, now, I don't know if this is part of this, but I was looking... Talk yeah, can we get some of those answers? Um, well, I think they're taking notes as we as we go. I hope so, yes. Yeah. Do people um, feel confident they can answer those questions well, as we go into well, the speed they, for you? They are, they are the experts in Herefordshire, yeah, so yeah. I hope they can just, pick up... I, I just want to check that the speed we're going at, people can pick up their questions and answer them. Um, yeah, so I can... Sorry, Kerry, what are you going to say? Yeah, I, I think I've got seven questions there, Councillor. One is about the referral time for CAMS. Um, I don't know the answer to that. I'm sure somebody in the room can give an answer to that, but I'm not sure for me. Have second questions, so I'll come back to that point if I may. Schools Have schools been offered additional training? Yes, they have some, but not enough would be my view, and it's not been systematic would be my view. And that's a, that's a capacity issue, but the whole point about setting up some mental health and wellbeing champions in schools will be because that then forms a group which you can then train. So that's not, that's, been offered it's been a bit um it's not been formalized in any sense and therefore it's been a bit uh, hit and miss in some cases that's the second question third question covid recovery funds there are covid recovery funds from central government they tend to come um with with heavy strings attached so the laptop schemes or the so on can only be the money can only be spent on that there are covid recovery funds still with us but i'm not sure they're actually school facing i think they're more community facing i don't know whether anybody can um, and us, emily's got her hand up so i might come to emily for a bit more on that one um, how many children additional children have been affected i wouldn't know the answer to that without going back to a more systematic survey unless somebody else in the room can answer that for me i'll share your view about blackmaston and bar school and indeed westfield actually in lempster they're all good schools the special schools have been pretty heroic in managing the pandemic in my view um, and they've been, because of the nature of the, the intake of the youngsters, they've actually had extra hurdles and barriers to, to cope with. Elective home education. We do still have an elective home education officer, um, at, and she has been visiting the families in their homes all the way through. Uh, we didn't see the same spike that other local authorities saw. There was a gentle increase in the number of children who elected to go home education, but actually the online um, option brought some back in to the system 
So we've ended up with roughly the same amount, which is about 350 youngsters who do elective home education um, for different reasons. And I take your point about Riverside. Riverside do an exceptionally good job as well. Many schools do do that kind of work, but again, it's largely school driven. So it could probably be a bit more coordinated than it is at the moment. So I think I think that was your questions. And I've got a volunteer, I think, for the referral times for CAMS, but I'm ashamed to say I can't remember who it was. Um, <laughs> so, and I so, think um, Elaine Cook Tippins can do the waiting times for CAMS. Thank you. So in the slide. Yes, thank you. In the slide deck, you'll see the waiting times for CAMS generically, but our mental health and schools teams that Councillor Kenyon is referring to only went live in November. And as far as I am aware, there are no significant waits at all for access for uh, mental health support in the secondary schools. However, if you have heard different, Councillor Kenyon, please let me know and I'll follow that up. The good news, Councillor Kenyon, also is that um, Herefordshire has been successful in attracting Wave 7, which starts in September 22, which is going to cover 20 primary schools in Herefordshire for the mental health and schools teams. And we've selected those 20 based on a number of um, data and demographics information. So schools like Riverside, Marlbrook, St Martins, our adored Black Marston School, they're all in our top 20 schools that we're going to target come September for a new mental health support team. So I'm really excited about that. I'm really passionate about that. Um, so I can't tell you exactly the mental health and school team referral weights, but I'll get that back to you. But generically, for CAMS in Herefordshire, generally, we sit within our KPIs. All young people are seen within 26 weeks for treatment, which is too long. And we're trying to get that down. But there's a slide in the deck that indicates that the majority of young people are seen much more quickly than that. Thank you. Can I come back on that? But just before you have any more questions, any other answers anybody wish to give to the points that Councillor Kenyon raised before we go on? To his next questions. Okay, Councillor Kenyon, yes, carry on. Thank you for answering those well, so far. Um, before Kerry came in, I was going to try and finish on a high, because I asked a lot of questions there. Um, but I will say, looking at the talk community and what they, they've been saying, <coughs> swimming pool, things things that getting getting children active and that sort of stuff, helping with their mental well being. The swimming pools are always very difficult. You have to book it now, it's very difficult to get it um, into the pool. I hope that's going to change because they're still working on pre COVID numbers area for the swimming pool so that, that's a bit of a disappointment there um, but hopefully that'll change soon and it just the, the positive things that the, the hereford city hereford city council supported the, the junior park run um, i know the park run is very successful within hereford and uh, the city council have put some funding into the junior park run which will start in six or seven weeks time once it once it's all registered again that's really good news for young people and you can almost socially describe along with hopefully fingers crossed the long awaited um, Hereford cycle track which is going to be built down the halo so all these things you can start looking at social prescribing for children which is going to be fantastic because it a healthy healthy body healthy mind and that goes right away from the youngest to the oldest so these are the positives that we need to be looking at and do ensure that you socially prescribe these these things for these, for these young people and that's my finish on the positive thank you we didn't actually talk about aspects of getting fit active and that's part of mental health early on this morning but Kerry or anybody else would you like to comment on what Councillor Kenyon saying and how much emphasis we're placing on that a part of ensuring good mental health? No, no I'm pleased to hear those final suggestions at the end Chair we can certainly communicate those facilities out to schools in the near future and encourage their use that's good thank you, thank you, thank you. Councillors. thanks thank you Councillor Kenyon uh, I know, Councillor Fagan, you have had your hand up for a while. Over to you now. Yes, th thank you. And um, thanks very much to everybody who um, prepared this report. I mean, I have to say that reading it makes me feel like we're sitting on a time bomb. I, I find it quite, quite frightening. Um, and I know that uh, there, a lot of schools have had some support for um, um, kind of educational catch up. But I, I think for many schools that they I've heard from teachers that they feel that that's come at, a, at the cost of the kind of emotional catch up. 
So, uh, for for example, I've heard teachers say that uh, at the upper end in the um, PSHE. Uh, curriculum that actually there isn't enough time for the PSHE curriculum because there's so much catching up to do in terms of all, all the other academic subjects and I, I think that this uh, you, you know is potentially a, a problem because um, I mean as, as you're describing here these these sort of emotional issues are are really really important um, so well, that's one one question is just to find out you know is is there colloquial evidence that uh, PSHE is is having to um, sort of go by the side because of the um, more um, academic catch up and then also I just uh, want to do I mean the, this issue of uh, child uh, the you, children learning through play and I think particularly for the for the younger the younger generation who are missing in their language skills and or all of that kind of interaction I, I I think there's there's so much evidence to say that children learn so much better through play and you, you know is there I mean we we did have uh, one of our Herefordshire schools they they used to have animals and children would help look after the animals and the children that were struggling would go and sort of look look after the guinea pigs and the the llamas and and actually the the consequences of that were enormous for for those children and I just feel that actually this is a really good opportunity I'm wondering if you um, potentially there is opportunity for us to look further at kind of how forest schools within the county could actually support the the education of the children because a child that is not happy can't actually learn anything um, so so that was the the one question and then also I just want to raise the point that as far as I understand a lot of schools there was quite a lot of funding that came through COVID and and then the government said well there's more uh, there's more funding but actually the reality for a lot of school bursars is that actually there's less funding and apparently the more funding is just less of a cut than was actually going to be uh, that was anticipated so um, there isn't actually more funding for schools as far as I understand there's actually less and I feel that we you you know as a council we we should actually be lobbying our MPs and saying for goodness sake our children are facing a crisis of such magnitude and if we don't sort it out we're gonna have uh, another social crisis on our hands so um, that's what I wanted to say and I think within that there are a couple of questions thanks Thank you, Tony. Councillor Hewlett, I think you're up next. Um, well, perhaps, um, is there anybody from the panel who would like to respond to um, Councillor Fagan first, please? Can I just say that in the education um, in our in the local authority, we had a bit of money towards supporting. Well, we had a focus on well-being as as part of it, so we put um, seventy thousand towards SEMH kind of projects and we opened up that to all schools to nurseries to everybody and some of the options we gave were to train for forest schools to train for thrive and to also support with outdoor areas so to develop those so that they can have that support so children can go to certain areas <coughs> to help with their mental health and well-being and that was really successful and as far as I know that it was all used up for that we also had we also then put 60,000 towards supporting children who had um attendance issues due to COVID, due to high levels of anxiety. So we have put towards and we have supported schools and earliest provisions with SEMH for those people who've identified and everybody was able to apply for that. And just to say that obviously learning through play is really important and I completely support that and I really understand that. And in the early years, it's a very broad and balanced curriculum where you're looking at children's needs all of the time and making sure that you're kind of applying all of those skills and everything. And I think that um, the new kind of curriculum allows you to do that really well. I'll stop now. Can I say when you answer, can you give your name? Because we can't see all the names. Sorry, today. Emily Garner. Yeah, Emily Garner. I thought it was Emily, yeah, but thank you. <laughs> Okay. Thanks for reminding for Jenny, we didn't actually have an answer to Tony's question. So thank you, Tony. Uh, did you have a question then, Jenny? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, I'd like to ask a question around, um, and this is because of conversations that I had very early on as, as a new councillor with Kerry, and we talked about where do you see the gap in provision in the county? 
And in 2019, it was clearly a mental, um, emotional and mental health in primary school. So we knew already that that was an area. And, you know, how much, a, a, so are we, I don't need to describe how much we're chasing a horse that's already bolted and how much we can play what we're given by the DFE to our advantage. So, you know, when I looked at the, the, um, the suggestion of from the DFE for attendance officers, my reflection was that we have quite a lot of inbuilt resilience in Herefordshire in relation to attendance, which you referred to, Kerry. And the, in my experience as a teacher was always that that was, that was largely the school's role. And um, I think when you were talking about it, you did sort of make some sort of, I wonder what conversation you've had with the DFE to say, oh look, the priorities here in Herefordshire are, and you can describe those for us in relation to mental health and in relation to the national picture. We, we've already got children coming through at Brookfield speaking in American accents and, you know, not being able to engage with their early years learning because, you know, they, they were born in the pandemic and that's all they've experienced is that sort of environment. So, you know, that being the case, I'd just like to reflect how we can put as much energy as possible into those early years because we've heard this morning of the good work that's already taking place in relation to uh, a, um, a mental health strategy and but that's only started in in last November which is 2020 so it was as if the fire was already well underway before we could get a grip on it now yeah I know these things are difficult, but when you, I looked back at the chat in 2019, it was already saying we haven't got the baseline data. We need we need some work done on the mental health pathways for children, um, and and that a little some of that work has already been done, and I'm sure it's going to be ongoing. But you know we have community safeguarding partnership. We have the community safety partnership, we have the domestic abuse local partnership, we have talk community. There are lots of really engaged, possibly as a result of the pandemic, agencies we can go to. So I'd like you to talk a bit about how we're going to capture that bolted horse. Is that a question for me, Councillor? Well, I don't disagree with any of that, of course. And I joined late 2019, as you know. I think one of the I think we did know that we had real capacity issues amongst our special schools and crews even then. And the pandemic simply thrown that into sharp relief, really. So I don't differ there. That was behind my comment the attendance officer comment, I think behind my comment comment there about they don't have to be called attendance officers. It's the old fashioned attendance officers. Um, was a fairly limited role and I think we can be more creative around that now. Um, I don't disagree either with the suggestion that we need to invest more heavily in the early years and preschool provision, I accept that. I, I just wonder whether it might be helpful because in terms of the mental health pathways, there is a slideshow we prepared which which talks to some of this thing, you know, at some point, and it might be helpful to, to, to go to the slideshow and then pause at various natural breaks within it, because that will, that will answer some of these questions that are coming up now. And then final comment from me would be to pick up on something Councillor Janssen said, which is about, do we need to lobby the DFE or MPs about funding? Y you are right. They will say they've given us more funding. Um, but in fact, that's been quickly eroded by inflationary pressures and so on. So the reality is there's, I think, sorry, I apologise, I think it was Councillor Fagan who asked that question, I beg your pardon. But, so I think there is an issue there about the so-called increase in funding for schools. Um, what's undone us a little bit is the schools locally are, are so well managed that actually the, the strings are attached to some of the post-COVID funds, which say if you've got any money in your reserves, you have to spend those first. And in fact, I think there was, a, there was, a, there was an offer to help schools with the additional cost of supply cover recently, for example. But you had to spend your resources first before you and we when we looked into it, only six schools in the county were eligible for that for that extra funding. So I would support that call really. But I, I come back here to the suggestion that actually there's a slide deck here which might answer some of these questions in a bit more detail than I can here and now, if that makes sense. 
because yes, you've got. Yes, I was going to say we have the slide pack which you referred to earlier. I haven't forgotten it. We yeah, said we'd have a pause to ask questions, then come back to it. Okay. So I think it would, would have a good idea to do that. I just wanted to pick up the thought in the early years. We discussed it in the workshop, of course, and reassured you. And we had this very impassioned presentation from Emily about the importance and emphasise that we as a committee fully recognise that, and we're pressing for officers to show as soon as possible an emphasis on greater investment in early years in order to reduce the cost and all the rest of the stuff that follows afterwards. But obviously we have an immediate improvement plan to go through initially. We've had that conversation yet this committee is determined to make sure we keep making that point on yours and the officer's behalf about the sooner we get to more investment in early, early years the better. So yes, would you like to talk us through the, the, the pack please, you and whichever other officers with you are sharing it with you. Thank you. Kerry, yeah. before you start, Councillor Newman said she actually had a follow-on question to what she asked before, which you probably better yeah. serve to ask yeah. now rather than later, if that's it, okay, please. Kerry, yeah, unless it, it, it is possible that this may come up in your slides, but what, I, I saw that we had wave three, and then there's a gap, four, five, and six. I don't know what happened to waves four, five, and six, or whether we just weren't eligible for them. But when we talked about uh, wave seven, there was an identification of particular schools, and they were largely urban schools. And actually, when we look into the, the, the demographics for, um, yeah, there are key, um, you know, settlement centres which have indices of deprivation where cohorts of children may have more educational you know impairment impact but it also shows that a significant proportion of our population who who may have that sort of impact are scattered around in the rural areas so i'd like to have some assurance that in that wave seven there has been some consideration given to some sort of outreach for early years in rural areas. Do we know? Can you or someone else answer that please, Kerry? I cover it in the slides. Yeah. Yeah, okay, I think great. it's covering the slides. Right. Just, the slides yeah. just, just, for the, just for the record, Chair, they're not actually my slides. Some of them are. Some of them belong to other agencies and partners in the room. So there's a sort of batting order we've worked out here. I can't okay, remember fine. who's talking the first one, actually. If you could give your names when you're presenting so we know yeah. that, that would be very yeah. helpful. Thank you. Not sure who's presenting this slide, folks. That's me. So I, I also didn't thanks. know whether I was going first, second, third, but yeah. uh, here I am. Thank so um, I'm Hilary Jones. I'm the principal casework manager for the special educational needs and children with disabilities teams. Um, so We've seen a growth over a number of years, but um, it's been a more rapid growth since um, 2020 and COVID um, of the number of children in Herefordshire who are considered by schools to require um, SEN support. Um, so nearly a fifth of our children now and just over a fifth of our children um, have an a education, health and care plan for their social and emotional and med mental health needs. That's the highest need type that we have in Herefordshire of special educational needs. We've got higher numbers of roles of, of pupils on roles at special schools now and the uh, because we are running out of room in our um, local authority maintained and academy special schools, we are increasing our expenditure on independent school places because if the child needs a special school place and we haven't got a space in a local authority school, we we will um, make provision at an independent school. So um, especially for children with autism and social, emotional, and mental health difficulties, um, we've got an increased number of children. And, and that increase also because those um, independent schools are not located in central places, they're, they're sort of quite far right. Some of them aren't even in Herefordshire, they're on the um, borders of Worcestershire, Shropshire and um, Powys. And so we've got the additional um, cost there of transport. So if you could go to the next slide, please. So um, I covered some of this in the workshop this morning, but in Herefordshire, we have um, the graduated response, which is what we would ordinarily expect schools and earlier settings and 
further education settings to follow um, to make provision for children with a range of special educational needs um, from universal services, what we would expect them to do for all children, right through to um, those children with really complex and high end needs. So if you could go to if and if you see in your packs, you will be able to click that link and you can read the whole quite a long one as you can see it's over 64 pages um, so it covers every every um, sort of um, category of uh, special educational need and it gives schools and settings a really clear pathway of the sorts of um, resources that they could use or interventions that they could um, demonstrate to meet the needs of children at different points on the spectrum of need next slide please Thank you, Hilary. So just um, these are some of these are just um, screenshots really of um, some of the sorts of things that we would see. So universal, all children, this is the majority of children will, some of them will periodically have times where they have poor social, emotional, and mental health. They may have experienced a bereavement. They may have experienced, um, you know, their parents separating. Um, there will be a difficult period in their lives that they need support to overcome. Um, but that if that is, if they are getting that right support and, and they don't experience any other adverse childhood experiences, they should be able to make a bounce back and, and be resilient enough. We've got some other children, about 15% of our children who are what we consider to be SEN support, who need a higher level of support and schools have got up to £6,000 to um, put in interventions to support those children and can apply for additional funding if they can evidence that they need it. And then we've got about 4% of our children in Herefordshire who need specialist provision. Um, so they will need a special school or they will need highly, um, highly trained staff to be able to deliver interventions for them. And we see that sort of um, that model, we, we want to um, sort of mirror that with um, mental health support in schools. So if you could go on to the next slide, please. Oh, just so each also just with the graduated replace each each area. So it talks about the sorts of assessments that you could consider, the sorts of intervention and support that schools should be putting in place, and then how they how often we would expect that to be um, evaluated and reviewed. So the whole uh, process with special educational needs is this assess, plan, do, review. So we just keep it's a cycle of um, what does the child need, what are we planning to do put the support in and then review how it's working. Um, if you could go to the next one. So um, this is about the, the mental health support in um, schools, which so the mental health support teams in schools are now called West, which is um, I have to keep reminding myself well-being and emotional support teams. So the, this mirrors the sort of um, graduated response. So we would, um, this would be our targeted, our 15% sort of group through to our um, higher end. So it's a national programme. Um, in the long term, by 2024, the NHS want to have just under half of all the schools in the country to um, have uh, support from um, one of these teams. Um, we had the first, the last wave that Herefordshire was part of, um, I, I, somebody mentioned earlier what happened to four, five and six. I think those all went to Worcestershire. So wave three, um, we have one team in Herefordshire, which is covering the high schools. So that's all high schools. And there is a nominated person from um, West working in each of our Herefordshire high schools, liaising with the senior mental health lead. And as I, I put in the chat, I don't know if everybody saw, schools have been able to apply for um, £1,200 to um, ensure that their um, senior mental health lead has had sufficient training um, to be able to do that role. Um, then Wave seven will be focusing on our primary schools. So we have identified 20 primary schools of our most in need. So we've looked at health inequality data. We've looked at numbers of uh, pupils on roll, but we've also looked at local intelligence. So we know that some of our most vulnerable children are um, children with a social worker, children who are looked after, and they might not necessarily come up in the health inequality data. We also know that our um, Gypsy Roma Romani traveller children um, quite often experience a higher level of mental health need. So we've looked at, we've taken all of that into consideration. So it isn't just the urban areas. We, we've, we've looked at a lot of um, inequality data and 
I can't tell you which 20 they are at the moment because those schools have yet to confirm that they definitely want to take part. Um, but we know which 20 it is and it will be announced soon. Um, and we are also looking at doing a mapping exercise because we know that um, a variety of our schools use um, different, they bring in different private providers to provide uh, mental health support in schools, um, some commission um, private therapists. So we're looking to do a mapping exercise across the whole of Herefordshire to say this, this is what's on offer. These, this is um, some of the um, interventions that schools are using and so that we can share that good practice with others. So if you're a very little school that might only have one child that has a higher level of need, you might not know where to turn, but we're hoping to have a sort of um, a toolkit, if you like, so that schools can say, oh, right, I can see, you know, school down the road has used this provider. We'll, we'll get in touch and see if we can make links. Jay, can I just come in on that? Yeah, Councillor Kennedy, I'll have to ask a question. Uh -huh. uh, thanks. Uh, listen in the way they intently. Um, each school has got a, a SEN representative, and, and, and schools now are, are far better at doing that. Is information uh, shared with these from these teams and the people going round? What sort of what information around SCN? So the schools, so the SEN code, depending on the size of the school. It might be that the um, special educational needs coordinator is also the mental health lead, but it might be that they're two separate people in a big a big high school, for example. It might be that the safeguarding lead is the mental health lead and the SENCO. So I would expect and schools should be coordinating amongst themselves so that children who are um, experiencing poor mental health and it is affecting their education that the SENCO and the Mental Health League would both be aware of that and would be linking with the um, wellbeing and emotional support teams. That's what I would be expecting. Okay, but so you don't know it. Um, it's all okay to expect it, but if these West teams are going around, are they not contacting these <coughs> SENCOs and all the rest of it? Um, that's the question I'd like to be answered, thank you. I don't know if the SENCO is the Mental Health lead in all the high schools. So I, I, the, the West teams are linking in with every high school with the senior mental health lead. Whether the senior mental health lead and Senko are the same person, I don't know, but I can ask the high schools if that is the decision that they've made. OK, yes, great. And if you could report back to the chairman of the committee, that'd be fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you both. So do you want to carry on then, Hillary, with the presentation? Yep. Yeah. I'm just making a note to email the Senko. Thank you, yes. So um, the graduated pathway, so you, um, I explained the graduated response in terms of um, meeting needs and um, special educational need. But this is the graduated pathway um, for children in early years in key stage one. This is what we, some of the things, so if it's in black, it's already happening. Blue, it's, you'll see some blue slides um, later on. Black, it's already happening. Green, it's about to, um, it's it's happened, but we haven't got sort of hard data yet about the impact of that. Um, and blue is, it's coming in the next 12 months. So in the early years, um, we have high quality teaching and pastoral support. Um, and then moving on from that, the school or earlier setting might request support from our behaviour support team, um, which is free to them. Um, then if, if there is an increasing intensity of need um, and children are experiencing attachment difficulties, we might be asking. So we have got nurture groups now in um, six of our primary schools across the county um, and those children can at, um, attend the nurture groups there um, and they will get um, a year's worth of assessment and specialist input um, and they will the nurture groups will be gathering um, assessment information and at the end of that that child may be um, ready to reintegrate back into mainstream school or it might be deemed that um, they have got underlying ongoing social emotional mental health difficulties and they might need an intervention placement at Brookfield um, or they might need a long-term placement at Brookfield which is obviously our SEMH school so that's the early years and key stage one pathway 
go to the next one. So key stage, so um, our key stage two, three and four. So this is um, top end of primary and high school. Again, we would be expecting the school to um, put in um, an inclusive um, teaching and pastoral support programme, um, a whole school mental health um, and wellbeing strategy. Um, the school should have a mental health lead um, and they should be using the interventions that are laid out in the graduated response. The school can, um, so the behaviour support team for key stages two and above um, is on a, um, that they buy in the support. So using their nominal um, SEM budget, they can buy in support from the behaviour support team to um, observe and advise. They we we have recently started um, a, a, an educational psychologist going into school to hold what we call a GPS meeting, a group problem solve, which is um, it's a very structured meeting. It involves parents, um, any professionals involved. The child is also their voice is heard um, and they look at what the difficulties are, what the strengths of that child are and how those strengths could be used to overcome those difficulties. And then looking at the under cause, underlying causes of the behaviour um, and put together strategies about how, what everybody can do to help that child to um, manage how they're feeling in school. And those are free. Um, so, sorry, something's just flashed up on my screen. <laughs> um, then the next, uh, the next graduated um, response would be um, having an intervention place at, um, at Brookfield in key stages one or two, or a, an intervention place at um, the pupil referral service, um, which schools would fund um, at key stages three and four. And if all of that has happened and um, they, it was still an increasing intensity or, or more specialist provision is required, um, then um, an education, health and care plan would be applied for um, so that the child could attend a special school. Just a, we've got a couple of questions on the <coughs> graduated pathway. Hilary, yep. uh, Councillor Hugh wanted to ask a question first and then Councillor Kenyon. Um, thank you, Hilary. Um, yeah, I'm interested in, in where you see anybody falling through the gap in this graduated pathway. And I'd also like you to describe, please, um, you know, the nurture group and what takes place there. Who, what level of um, expertise is leading that nurture group? Who, who is it for? Who's, who's in it? Um, I, I just there isn't much description around how okay so goes. so the nurture group is overseen by the principal educational psychologist and the lead behavior support <coughs> team teacher so they have selected staff in to work in those nurture groups across um the the settings so those staff will have received training um on top of their ordinary ordinary teach training they have had specialist um support um, from the principal educational psychologist and behaviour support team on strategies and um, and yeah the um, sort of each one is slightly unique so I would hate to say it was done like this so each one is unique to its its own school so that no two of them are exactly the same um, but each one has about six children attending and those children are referred by um, early years and key stage one school uh, pro providers through the behaviour support team. So the behaviour support team will have identified the children um, across the um, across Herefordshire and it will be the, the children that are most in need. I suppose where the where I see the gaps will be is I think this is there'll be a growing need and we will need to set up more nurture groups as time goes on. Um, and I think another gap with that is that some children will make really good progress at their nurture group school. So, for example, Leinster Primary have got a nurture group. So you might go to Leinster Primary from your um, your original school and then you make friends at that school because you've made really good progress and you've been helped to regulate your emotions. And so now you've made friends there and you might not want to go back to your school. So we might see some sort of movement of pupils. But we don't have we don't have enough children. We've got too many, but we don't have enough for every school to have a nurture group. 
Okay, so um, what happens um, if there's um, a cost impact to parents because of their child's need to travel? If a child, if a child's school is, if the school that it's the nearest school that can meet a child's needs, and if that is over three miles away, then they would be entitled to transport. So, uh, because it's an identified educational need, they'll get yeah. transport, okay. Okay, that meets their needs. Okay, I'll to Councillor Kenny. Thank you, Hillary. Councillor Kenny. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, there's one relevant to this, and there's one that I perhaps drop in here anyway. Um, uh, exclusions, I've got a bit of form myself, to be fair. I was, ex I was expelled from school, and look at me now. Um, but exclusions, um, is it right that the money doesn't follow very quickly, or has that changed? Um, for the schools picking up, does, that, does this make sense to you? The the money, I'm no, I'm not sure. I, so, if a child is permanently excluded from a school, do you mean where where yeah, does the money yeah. go? If a child is permanently excluded from the school, then they it the school, go to the new school it should go to the new school. That's correct. Well, but it doesn't very quickly, or they don't like sending it. As I no, they don't. No, no. Yeah, so perhaps that needs to be addressed. That's the point I was making. It's, it's, it's easy. School. It's easy if it's a local authority maintained school because the money we can move the money. If it's yeah. an academy, yeah. we don't have their money, so we can't. No, that's it. As, as a fifteen-year-old, you could have just given it to me, and I'd have happily sent <laughs> it off. That's another story. And, and that you brought in my other question, lovely there as well. Obviously, LA and a local authority and academy schools they they operate differently. But does this cover private schools as well within Herefordshire? Because obviously. Uh, it's mental health needs within every child. Do we look at private schools as well? So, um, private schools do are not eligible for the £1,200 mental health lead training allowance that I mentioned earlier. They're allowed to access the training, but they have to fund it themselves. And as with many DfE guidance, it they they it's for advice for independent schools rather than statutory. So maintained in academy schools, it's often statutory guidance um, and independent schools don't have to do it if they don't want to. Thank you very much for clearing that up. But perhaps, um, Chairman, uh, through you, that, that we need to look at to, to ensure that money does follow quickly because the school that's taken on these child's, their, child's that have been, the children that have been excluded, um, they take it on at their own cost. So perhaps we need to look at Get it we can probably quick. just have a conversation about it. That you might have to make a recommendation and we follow up and make sure. I'm not allowed to make recommendations, Chairman, because I'm not on this committee. You can make a recommendation. It's only voting on it that's the issue, so you certainly can. Mm -hmm. It's up to us then to vote on it. Well, I'd like to make a recommendation at the end then. Okay. I, I've already made a note to ask you to do that. Jenny reminded me too, so that sounds like a good area that we should be following up on. Thank you. Is that the end of your question, Jim? Yes, for now. Thank you. Do you want to carry on with your presentation then, Hilary? I think I've only got one more slide, but yes, I'll be... Okay. Yeah. I think this is my last slide. Um, so, um, so this is um, secondary age children with um, really severe anxiety, including autism. Um, and the... Sorry okay, sorry. Um, so yes, where um, so we would expect schools, as I said before, uh, you know, always the first um, the first step on any of the pathways is uh, you know high quality provision in schools that we would expect to see um, for all children. Um, when we start to see that school attendance is declining, we would want that school to work with the um, wellbeing and emotional support teams, or the, um, that's that have been in since November, or the um, educational psychology service in Herefordshire are starting. Um, it will be rolling out in the next 12 months a um, emotional but emotionally based non-attendance project so that will be the educational psychologist working with it will be like the group problem solve but on a bigger scale to try and engage that child um, re-engage them whether it's with their mainstream school or looking to see um, 
if support can be um, put from the autism outreach um, or whether that child needs um, support through one of our um, autism resource bases. Um, if that's not successful in keeping the child in school, um, the West team would ask the CAMS consultant to recommend that the child goes to the home hospital and uh, the home hub and hospital service H3, which is run by the pupil referral school. Um, we would hope that they would be able to re-engage that child or young person in education through a mix of um, uh, home tuition, online, face-to-face -face, and at the hub. So they've got their own resource hub um, by ASDA. Um, and then hopefully we would like to see them return to mainstream um, or that period of time we would be gathering information for an education health and care plan and they might need um, specialist intervention so for secondary school pupils that might be at the bridge um, resource provision at bishops um, we are also hoping in the next 12 months that we will have been able to open a second autism hub if they can't access mainstream so bishops have got um, seven pupils there at the moment but we do appreciate that if you have um, high levels of anxiety and autism um, attending a resource base within a school of a thousand pupils it's possibly quite overwhelming so trying to find a, a, an alternative um, that's not to say it works for those seven but it's not going to work for all children with autism so finding um, so that is in the next 12 months um, we will be finding a, a second autism hub that is not um, on the grounds or within a big mainstream school I think that's the last of my slides. Thank you. Before we move on, we've got two questions. I gather, Councillor Hanson, you had a question. I'm sorry, I can't see all the screen. Uh, Jenny, did you do see anybody putting their hands up? Could you let me know? But I, I believe Councillor Hanson, you've had your hand up. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Chair. I was just going to say, first of all, um, just really quickly, I was blown away by Michelle's um, talking about Brookfield and how fantastic that is. Um, I met a young man last week who went to the farm school um, and because he couldn't go to normal schooling and we had a very good conversation about his the bull at the school and that was tremendous and I, what I what would like is that we've got these special schools and they should have much higher profile in, within our community that people should know about them and, and appreciate them. And um, and also with regarding autism, the um, autism spectrum, I mean, personally, I am coming across this because my son is grown up, but with um, severe anxiety, uh, he is, has a disability and he, they, the psychiatrist have said he is on the autism spectrum. So this is something that, that, that we went, our children were young we didn't know about um, and now this is much more high profile and um, hopefully we'll will be helped and the, the last thing I was going to just to, to say um, was I was very blown away by the remark um, that was made this morning that children are more vulnerable when at home these some of these children now now, for our, for, our, for our children with mental problems, if they're more vulnerable at home, in Ledbury, we have no provision for children outside of their school. Um, so they're, if they're ex being excluded from school, there is nowhere for them to go outside the school. And if they're more vulnerable at home, what are we doing about it? So we, um, we're doing it in schools, but where are we doing it in the community? Um, and, and just a question of Bishop of Hereford, it's not the Bishop of Hereford, is it? Is, is it? Um, what is Bishops of Hereford? It's a high school. It's a school. Bishop, Bishop of Hereford Bluescoat School is a school. Oh, it's a Hereford. Bluescoat. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. And, and, and if, if you are excluded from any school in Hereford, regardless of where you live, there is a pupil right. referral school that you can attend. So we don't have we have one of everything. So we we do have. So it, regardless of whether you live in Ledbury or Leominster or Kington or Ross and Wye, there is a pupil referral school that you can attend. Yes, thank you. I'm thinking of of of, of the times of the children when it when it's not school when it's not school time. 
Oh, we the state had an incontextual safeguarding environment. There is, like in Ledbury, we don't have a youth activity centre anymore. I think it's common throughout the county, but it's a great gap in provision that we, we need to fill. I know you share a passion for that. Sorry, I do apologise. I did have two more slides. I didn't realise. No, that's okay. I just want to say, Helen, did that? It wasn't really yes. question, but I think it answered your yes. point, okay? Yeah, no, thank, Summer, you. thank you very much. Thank you, Helen. Councillor Summers had a question. Thank you, Chair. Um, just what, I'd like to know the process for diagnosing autism, etc. There's so much out there right now. Uh, diagnosing is a difficult process. Uh, I, I presume there's a, there's a diagnostic pathway that uh, I know yeah, the health, health, health run the diagnostic pathway. Um, in, in answer to your question this morning, I contacted the community pediatrician at the Child Development Centre who said they haven't changed the um, multi-diagnostic, um, the multidisciplinary assessment process in Herefordshire since 2018 and his, his, his professional opinion as to why we have more children with education, health and care plans with autism now is because more children with autism are being referred by their school for an education health and care plan. Um, he said more children have been diagnosed in the last 12 months and in the previous 12 months, but that was because of COVID and they're now catching up. But he said the numbers of children with autism aren't substantially increasing in line with the number of children with a plan with autism. If that makes sense. Okay. Do we know when the when the earliest uh, year is to diagnose any of the illnesses, uh, mental health illnesses? You'd have to ask a pediatrician. I'm afraid I don't know. Okay, but it it, it must be something that we should be looking at as uh, as a council because it's the start fairly young. So so uh, you can apply for an education, health, and care plan from birth. We wouldn't be assessing a child at birth because it's too early so but we we oh, have children sure. Emily I don't know if you know we have children being assessed on the pathway at two and three so I think that's the earliest that, that our um, colleagues in um, the community paediatrics team would be looking at they are definitely diagnosing children at two and three yeah so referrals can go in from um, paediatricians and other professionals prior to them starting nursery or nurseries can make referrals as well and they can be past the process. My question, as long as the daycare centres, etc., can uh, can refer is, is, is the main concern because it does start early, whether we, you know, and sometimes catching it earlier can really help. Thank you. Yeah, I think some of it also is the gathering of evidence so that because we have to follow the graduated approach, you have to show that evidence as well. So some of the time spent will be gathering evidence to, to kind of put towards the um, educational health care plan, but it can be done in nursery. Thank you. Thank you. We have more questions from you. Uh, Councillor Hay first. I know online, I gather you've got your hand up. OK, um, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I mean, I think this is a massive issue um, which covers so many different facets that I say, well, I think we'd be here a week actually trying to drill down to all of it. But there's just a few things I wanted to um, just get a bit of clarification on. Um, so with regards to what um, Hilary is saying about the mental health leads and the SENCOs with that potential crossover, I just wondered what would be the, the situation in a multi-academy trust, because I know that there can be shared SENCO sometimes and whether that means that maybe schools haven't got a designated mental health lead within the school. And um, this is something I'm, I'm always uh, banging the drum about is the fact that I, I, I want to see, you know, a designated person within every school, whatever the size. So it'd be good to, to sort of find out what the situation would be there. Um, and it's been really great and useful to have an update on the national program from Elaine and um, Hillary. Um, and with this, the West scheme sounds like things are happening, but um, it still seems to me that it's been done quite piecemeal. And I'm concerned about the fact that some schools are included in these schemes and some aren't. I mean, a sort of um, ambition of 50% of schools being involved to me is a, quite a low ambition. I mean, I think every school should really be having, um, you know, that, that involvement so I think this is uh, you know and I and I appreciate what Kerry was saying about the fact that we're still in the middle of, of COVID and managing COVID in schools but I think it's really crucial that we get an overview of what's going on in every school um, 
getting that holistic view um, because I think a lot of this, you know, I mean, it, this needs to be mental health support needs to be become part of the culture of schools um, and how we support that is really crucial. So um, I always use the words um, emotional resilience and I think we need to be building that emotional resilience in all children and particularly back to um, what Emily was saying, the, the early years and key stage one Building that emotional resilience is, I mean, I, I've, I've taught that age group. So I, I mean, it was something I always was really um, hot on doing was the circle time and making sure that children have that opportunity to just talk freely about their feelings and knowing that it's okay to not be okay. Um, Kerry drew attention to that cohort and they are one of the most vulnerable um, age, you know, cohorts that we need to look at because we learned this morning, shockingly, that speech and language difficulties that are identified in the early years can then translate into social and emotional difficulties further up because of the fact, the frustrations of, of, of the fact they can't communicate what they need. So, um, and again, just a drum again, um, I agree totally with what Councillor Fagan was saying. Enrichment activities are so, so crucial and it, 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 the, 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 you know the catch up monies that were promised that that obviously uh, didn't all materialise. I mean, to me, seventy thousand pounds of COVID monies for the for sort of things like forest schools and and and, and encouraging that sort of um, enrichment isn't just not enough money. I think we need to make sure that um, we um, put more monies into those enrichment activities in the early years. So. Um, I would like, if possible, obviously I'm not on the committee, but I would like via you, Chair, to get some more information on the uptake of those schemes, um, the COVID schemes that were, were encouraging those activities and see how many schools did take part and, and really why other schools didn't take part if they were able to apply for those monies. Um, maybe it was time limited, I don't know. But um, and really just to give a recommendation that um, I think with this this whole issue needs to be revisited when we can get a, a whole overview of, of where each school is in terms of the provision they've got for mental health needs. Thank you, Kath. You can certainly make a recommendation which we can then vote upon. I think you've pretty well done that. We'll come back and round that up at, at the end of the session. Um, any points anybody wants to make in answer to Kathy's points before we move on to... Councillor Hewitt's question. Okay, Councillor Hewitt, if you'd like to raise your question. I'd uh, just like to thank Kath for that um, plea because I think everybody in the committee here absolutely agrees with that. And I think actually from what officers are saying, they would agree with that too. So, um, but I have a bit of a concern about the um, response to my question this morning. So I, I think actually since I became um, Vice Chair, I've been asking about the diagnostic tool that we use for autism in Herefordshire and I know that there was a legal challenge to Herefordshire and I think it was around 2018 that we were one of 41 councils that we were using an outdated diagnostic tool. So. Um, I have asked and asked through the legal officer, and they, they said they'd check up, the answer has never come back, whether we're still using an outdated diagnostic tool. And from what you said, I can't really tell whether that's a, a new diagnostic tool and it's the one that's nationally accepted by the Autism Society, or whether we're still using the one that, you know, we're not meant to be using. So I can't, I, can't, I don't really understand. The, the response. So I'd like, I'd like an answer on that, please. Do you I mean? Jump in, yes. Hillary? Thanks. It's Elaine Cook Dickens from CAMS. My special interest is autism. So, um, and I am a, a person who can assess and diagnose autism. So I might be able to answer this. I am not aware of that legal challenge, and I would actually be really interested. Health okay. and health and uh, uh, multi-agency assessment teams follow NICE guidance to assess for autism, and that makes a recommendation that you must use a number of tools. One is a parent interview, one is a school interview, one is a semi-structured observational tool, but it does not name the tool in the NICE guidance. 
Now, I wonder if this is the ADOS assessment, which is the Autism Diagnostic Observation Schedule, which has recently been upgraded to the ADOS 2, perhaps. And maybe that is where this discrepancy is. But I really, I, I've not heard about that challenge, so I would be really interested. The ADOS 2 basically is the same as the original ADOS, although the norms were slightly updated to accommodate a wider range of um, diagnostic presentations over the period of time. Um, but really, that's the only semi-structured diagnostic observation tool that I can think of that might be called into question. But please let me know and I'll do that legwork for you because I'm actually really interested myself now. That would be really helpful, thank you. No Was worries. that Emily answered the question? Elaine. Elaine, okay, Elaine, Elaine right, thank yeah. you, just to make sure we know. Elaine Coates. Thank you very much for that. Councillor Canyon had a question. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. It was just trying to put uh, Councillor Anton's uh, mind at rest a little bit. We have got a um, Herefordshire branch of the NAS, National Autistic Society, which is run by a very enthusiastic Debbie Hobbs. Um, Hereford City Council has um, mentioned again today, they do some great work, never spoke about. Um, they've funded this on many occasions, so where the county council's been laughing a little bit, the city council stepped up. Um, they arrange events like um, quiet cinemas, shopping, flip out, which is a bouncy, bouncy place. They all have quiet hours, uh, shopping, supermarkets. Um, so they all do these things to support people with autism. So that's the other people going through. And I'd like to think, and this is my question, that our talk community, which is bigged up and hyped up quite a lot, um, are referring people to NAS, the National Autistic Society, and, and favourably as well, because they do a fantastic job. So I hope that's helped uh, Councillor Houston's um, query. Questions being addressed. Would somebody like to answer that question about talk community? Thank you. Here, I don't know, but I will check and can follow up with uh, talk community themselves and check that it's on the talk community directory. Yeah. Sorry, who was that again? Was that Elaine again? That's Rebecca. Sorry, it's Rebecca Howell Jones. Okay, Rebecca, yeah, I'll follow up on that. Boris, thank you very much. A question thank you, about, Councillor oh, Kenyon. Thank, yes, well, 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 well done, Helen, for that. And, and of course, the doors will get showed up. Jenny said about how much we support both the points that Councillor Kenyon and Ca Councillor Hay are saying about activities and enrichment helping enormously with people with mental health difficulties. I, I've got a question to ask as well, Hilary. This graduated pathway looks like a great scheme and there are many areas in it which it appears we have, to have yet to deliver on. It looks, it looks very promising. But can you just confirm how much the schools actually take it up and to participate in it? Have they actually bought into the whole process? Uh, and so do they really, um, including the academy schools, are they really making it work for them? Is there a universal acceptance and it's a, a good pathway to follow? Uh, the, the graduated response so if yeah. school is um applies to the local authority to say that um if well so there's two if they try to exclude a child for any reason um our school inclusion officer would be um, asking questions and we want to see what the school have done in terms of the graduated approach to make sure that that um, you know, the school had done everything they could to avoid an exclusion and she would also be um, looking to make sure that the school implemented it going forward following an exclusion. Um, so from that perspective, um, we do challenge schools on that and that's both academies and maintained schools. And likewise, as, um, as I said in the workshop this morning, if a school applies for funding or an education, health and care plan, if they have not been able to demonstrate to us that they have used the graduated approach in whether that is the mental health um, pathway or the um, the SEN pathway, we would be asking them for evidence of, as to where they've done that. So those are the two main areas where there's pushback. We also do have a school improvement um, lead um, who has a specialist interest in um, special educational needs and disabilities. And I know that when she is doing um, visits with schools that she will look at their you know, evidence of their graduated response. So that's sort of a um, a more informal way as she's looking at other areas. So she might be doing, um, you know, uh, supporting a school um, around improvement in one area, but she would be looking all the time for um, the, the evidence that they are using a, a, an inclusive graduated approach. Okay, thank you. Um, so would you say therefore most schools do follow that approach? Uh, so it's a minority of schools that push back on it 
And if there are barriers, if not enough schools are following up that term, the graduated approach. Are there any barriers that would prevent schools from doing it? <coughs> is it their own method, for example, or is there some other reason why they, they don't, if they don't? Um, I suppose um, exhaustion or um, just sort of they've run out of empathy when I, I think at the beginning of every academic year we see a big surge in you know schools wanting to be as inclusive and accepting and as solution focused as they possibly can be but it we do see higher towards the end of terms higher rates of not higher rates of exclusion but less tolerance and i think it's 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 mental exhaustion of staff um it 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 is that sort of i i can't go on another day so you you need to take this child out for the day so we'll exclude them so i suppose it fluctuates i would say we have the highest <laughs> amount of inclusion and sort of stick into the the, the pathway at the beginning of the academic year or the beginning of the term and it sort of wanes but then you see you know you, you see them coming back with a, a resurged sort of energy again after after just even a week off at half term they come back after just having that, had that break and you can see that inclusivity again and, and people just generally willing to give it another go. So there's a real correlation between teachers having teacher say, burnout absolutely yeah, yeah. having emotional and mental issues of their own in order to support the young children they look after with their mental issues and and, and if you're if you're a young person who has got um poor mental health and you do not feel contained and safe because the adults that are looking after you do not feel contained and safe yes. because they are exhausted on their knees then you're going to have more of a wobble than you would otherwise have so i think it's it's one of those it works both ways so i think young people can sense that the the adult supporting them is burnt out and will probably have a you know a bigger possibly a bigger meltdown than they would have done otherwise makes sense but difficult to understand how you mm. sort that right you have you have a couple more slides that you wanted to present well i i think this one's been up a while now so this is just really a um a selection of the sorts of support and training that um the local authority offers to schools um so um the emotional emotional literacy support assistance so that's um training and then they have ongoing support from an educational psychologist so they get supervision um the the elsa gets supervision um and that's that's been really really popular um the teenage brain if any of you ever see the teenage brain training it will just oh brilliant um makes so much sense um uh, especially if you've got a teenager i can't recommend it enough um we do trauma and uh trauma informed and attachment training of variety of um, training sessions on autism, ADHD. Um, the behaviour support team also do, um, they do team teach, which some, it, if you take team teach to the absolute end of the process, that will resolve in um, physical intervention. So holding a child to prevent them from hurting themselves or others. But the, the main emphasis of everything in team teach is preventing the need for an adult to get in a child's space so it is everything is about de-escalation and calming them down verbally walking away giving them some time to to you know um to cool down so it's it's absolutely not in um physical restraint training although it does say if you need to put hands on a child to prevent them from running in the road or hitting somebody then this is the safest way to do it um and then the Autism Education Trust um, have been funded until next summer um, to provide training to all the schools and the West team um, are working with um, the schools to look at whole school approaches to mental health. So those are the training. That's the training that we offer. Okay, schools also you. ask for little bespoke things as well. But OK, thank you. I know we got another person on line Councillor asking Fagan. a question. Councillor Fagan. Councillor Fagan. Yes, your hand up. thank you. I, I'm just, just interested to know whether all of that training, is that only for staff at schools or is that training offered to parents as well? Because I know as the as a sort of parent of young adults now that actually a lot of the, the help that I got was actually a, a sort of training sessions that went through the school and it was invaluable. And, you know, the, the issue about teenagers, you know, if more parents could actually be 
better informed about how to deal with teenagers you know I think society would be a better place I'm just curious about whether so it's we available. so sometimes the schools will say can you come and deliver this training for parents and they will do it so it's 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 the schools it's for the schools to arrange so for example emotion coaching training which is a really um simple way of helping a child to regulate um and to name their emotions so that you know the the emotion is fine but the behavior is not um quite often it, it's best done where parents are actually aware of it so that the same language is being used at home and at school so that is a really good example of where the school will say, right, we're going to be training all our staff and doing a refresher on emotion coaching. Let's get all the parents in. So, yes, we 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 can go out and do that. But it's at the school's request. And if, if I can just come back on that quickly, I think that, that it would be good if we could actually uh, sort of recommend somehow that schools uh, sort of engage more in um, supporting parents with courses like this, uh, given the extent of the, the difficulties that, that, are, that we're all facing. Any comment on that? Or is that just a remark? I'd, I'd make a comment on that. Yeah. Chairman, uh, so my, my view is um, if you've got a unruly teenager, um, on occasions that you, you don't want to be schooled by the school. Um, I, I can imagine the response from someone who, who come to my house to tell me it's how to look after my teenager or my 32 year old or my 21 year old or, or my eight year old. You know, I've got loads of kids, whole spectrum of buggers. Um, I quite like some of them, but um, if the school wants to, you know, they've got to ask the school. The school doesn't push it on the parent because they would get short change. Okay, that's, that's one thought. I'm mindful that time's moving on, Kerry. There's a few more slides. I don't know, would it be possibly sensible to go into the CAM slide? I think that's an important part of handling mental health that we should consider. Check. Yes, Chair, can I, can I just recommend, Chair, that actually there are quite a few more slides here. Yes, quite. Uh, this, and we've done a quite a little, we've given the schools issue quite a big airing here, but a lot of the rest yes. of it is public health. So I, I'd encourage a move to some of those slides if possible, guys. Okay. So I thought moving on to maybe the camp slide, but before we do, I know Councillor here. It's a very good question. question. And, and, and it's around having been a teacher in this situation where you have sometimes an emotionally dysregulated child is going to make the access to education for all the children in that classroom extremely unequal. They can't handle it. And I was interested in timescales with this graduated response and in resilience for a very hard battered teaching cohort. So already you're talking about teacher burnout just with having one child like that in the class. We're saying that we are going to have an awful lot more of dysregulated children who are meant to be going through the toothpaste tube of what you have to learn at different key stages. And I would like to see more resource put into teacher well-being and resilience because I think that you know we're focusing on the children but the children are dependent on having that resilience in the teaching cohort and it's partly about having strategies and you're doing staff training and stuff but it's also about the the time frame in which because I have talked to parents who said it takes a really really long time to get, or it has taken for their particular child, a long time to get a referral to a special school for, you know, well, dyslexia was one of the things I came across, autism was another one. So, um, yeah, how do, we, how do we address the urgency um, with which matters are addressed, you know, so that it doesn't impact the learning of all the children in the class, and to, you know, cherish that teacher in order to be able to resource them better to cope. Before we answer the question, I think that really plays back to what you said earlier, Hilary, about teachers getting exhausted and they can't help with the children they're looking after. So it would make sense with what Councillor Hewitt was saying to make sure we give better training and support for the teachers in order they can then deliver it. Your thoughts on that, please. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I agree that yeah, we teachers. Sorry, Kerry, did you want to come in? No, I was just going to answer 
uh, well, say, I'd say I welcome what Councillor Hewitt just said. Teacher burnout is a very real issue and risk and it's growing. And I would also include two school leadership teams in that. We've had to juggle the whole two years of dynamics now. We've, we are aware of that, but we've started to give a little bit of funding. It's only small funding because we haven't got a lot to the special schools for staff wellbeing initiatives. So the, our four special schools, Brookfield and the three MLD special schools, um, and in fact, the autism units out at Hampton Dean have all been, or will, about to get about £1,500 for staff wellbeing um, support. We've asked them to audit what they spend it on, but we've pretty much left it up to them because they'll know their staff better than we do. But that's a small gesture because it's only the four schools rather than the 100 schools that we've got in the county. But uh, I can echo your comments about teacher wellbeing as well. It is a very live issue at the moment. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there's somebody else online who wants to speak. Can't see no, the hands up. No hands up. Okay. No. Right. So can we move on a bit later <coughs> in the, the pack? I think it'd be good to look at the CAM slide, Kerry. Uh, this is such a big complex area. If you look at everything, it's getting quite overwhelming with all the content. But yeah, CAMs it's are such an important role. I think it'd be quite useful just to review who they are and what they do. Okay. That's about three slides on, I think. Okay. So I'm not sure who's presenting the CAM slide, Chair. Sorry. Um, and I don't know where it fits in. Is it the next slide, Cooth? One more, Kerry. Jack, there you go. Thank you, Jack. Are you on this one? Thank well, you. You skipped me quite helpfully. Uh, I won't be offended. It's a lane okay. now. Sorry. So okay, who could present to this? So it's Elaine Cook Tippins again. Thank you, Elaine. So uh, my first plea is for people to just keep in mind that CAMS Although it stands for Child and Adolescent Mental Health, the S on the end is a service. And actually, CAM services are commissioned by NHS England to provide very specialist mental health care for young people who've got moderate to severe mental health illness or mental health conditions. And um, we would have loved our consultant psychiatrist to join us this afternoon, Dr. Katie Powell, but unfortunately she's poorly today, um, to talk to you a bit about what we treat um, because I think there's a sense that CAMS treats everybody and everything. And actually, I, I'm hoping that our presentation today from our multi-agency perspective is showing that there's lots of work at all that universal and targeted level. But CAM services in, in, my, in my world, we treat children who've got uh, moderate to severe eating disorders. We treat children and young people who are experiencing psychosis which you might understand better as schizophrenia or those type of illnesses. We treat depression and bipolar affective disorder, anxiety, which comes into lots of brackets, OCD, phobias, tics and Tourette's. We treat PTSD and emotional dysregulation. We also look at children who've got neurodevelopmental difficulties. So that's ADHD assessment and management and autism assessment in the over 10s because our paediatric colleagues do under 10s and then we look after young people who have learning disabilities who also have mental health problems because we know that if you've got a, an intellectual impairment you are more likely to be experiencing mental ill health or lower resilience i know we've been talking a bit about resilience today so next slide please I just put this table in so you guys could see our referral rates. So you'll see, if you can remember how the pandemic went, I don't know if anyone's yet forgotten, but our baseline, we always use January 20 as our baseline because that was when the world looked like it did before the pandemic. We'd get about 120, <coughs> 110 referrals a month. And then of course we went into the pandemic in April 20 and you can see our referrals reduced right down to 42. They slowly started to climb back up and we're now back to about pre-pandemic levels, I would suggest. You'll see that January 20 was 120 referrals, January 22 was 128 referrals. Whilst our referral rate in Herefordshire hasn't increased significantly like we've seen across the rest of the country, what we have noticed is that we are seeing young people who are more acutely unwell they are coming to us more unwell. That is especially noticeable in young people with eating disorders who um, 
are often so unwell that they visit us at CAMS and we have to ask their parent to drive them to the hospital to admit them because they are so physically poorly. It's a phenomenon that we have seen nationwide, but Herefordshire has been acutely aware of that increase in young people presenting with eating disorders late. Next slide, please. I put this data in for you to review at your leisure. It shows you that we are generally able to see young people for assessment and treatment within 95 to 100% of our KPI. And I've also put the percentages of how long people generally wait. As I said earlier, this is too long. If it was my child, it would be too long. Um, and we are hoping to increase access to CAM services with the mental health support teams and schools with the new crisis offer. So our, our response can be even quicker. The NHS uh, is determined to increase access for more children to be seen more quickly. Next slide, please. Can I ask a question? Yeah, we'd like to ask a question, Elaine. Councillor Kenny, would like to ask you a question. Thank you. Elaine, Elaine this, you'll be pleased to know this is, isn't at you, uh, it's at the CCG and about what you're talking about. Um, is Herefordshire getting its fair share from the CCG? Um, obviously, Worcester's incorporated that as well. Um, I'd like to know um, a comparison of percentages that goes to Herefordshire and Worcestershire. I know Worcestershire's larger, and I want to know the facts and figures around the mental health side of that. So the CCG managed to miss that quiet this afternoon. Um, can you answer that for me, please? And while you're doing it, I'd like to know just who is it actually funds CAMS? Is it through Herefordshire Council or is it independent organisation? It's independent organisation. Don't understand. Okay. No, just answer those questions there, please. Thank you. Hello, uh, Jack Wayne right here. So um, historically, um, previously we had four separate CCGs across Herefordshire and Worcestershire. As of two years ago, we had two separate CCGs. And as of April 2020, we've been a single CCG across both counties. Um, I think it's fair to say that when the CCG and, and, and the two trusts um, merged to cover Herefordshire and Worcestershire, it was apparent that some of the Herefordshire services were less well-funded than their Worcestershire counterparts. For the last two years, which is certainly the time that I've been involved um, with Herefordshire, the, um, the proportion of funding uh, per population has been actually significantly more weighted towards Herefordshire. Um, this is simply being to, to, to level it up effectively. Um, I, I don't have fact, numbers and figures for you uh, to hand, but I can certainly get those. Uh, but I think historically, yes, Herefordshire has been less well funded when there were separate CCGs. Um, since it's been a single CCG and now a single trust as well, um, that balance is being redressed. That's the question, Councillor Gannon. Yes, it does. And perhaps through the chair that you can ask for those to be sent out to the committee when, they, when you receive them. Do what? Sorry. Yes, that can answer it. Perhaps when you receive them, uh, you can send them out to the committee. Indeed, so you can have a look. Let's certainly do that. Thank you. One more question, and I think we ought to move on to a debate about a good debate. I think it's pretty mind blowing the amount of information we've got, and we've only scratched the surface, but we must be beginning to close. We've got another subject to go through. One more question, Councillor Summers, and then I'll bring in a couple of councillors who haven't spoken yet, see if they've it's, got any comments. It's more a statement than a question, Chair. Uh, we, Herefordshire is getting probably more money, more funding for mental health than Worcester at the moment. Uh, one of my issues though is how that funding is being used and where it's going. Um, it's something we might want to discuss in the future. But we have been getting a, quite a bit more funding uh, as of late for GP practices, etc. I'm not sure if it's, been if it's been spent well, but we are getting it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Summers. Uh, I think we just sort of wrap it all up. Uh, Councillor Andrews joined us some time ago. Welcome, Graham. Uh, we saw you come in. Thank you. Oh, uh, you, you and Councillor Jones, I don't know if you've got any comments to add before we, we start to sum up. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, just, yeah. Just, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. I think it, uh, I, well, just going back to the report, which I think it's a very good report. But I, th I think that report highlights what's happening all across sectors in um, society today. In fairness. So, but it's good to have it in statistical form. 
Um, it'll be great to see it in your talk about Kerry in about six months, updating it. And um, yeah, see how things and and uh, just with the um, really answer the question with the communication and um, language um, that Jenny raised. How they actually going to address that? But um, I was just interested in the the American um, um, comment on it. That there was a lot of uh, yes. children uh, coming back with the American accents. Maybe it's uh, you know, to, to actually put that in the report, it must have been quite a few. So, uh, but um, yeah, that's one of my overall Thank you. Any comment on that, Kerry, anybody? No, well, just a quick comment from me. Thank you, Councillor. I agree with that. And the reason I suggest six months and maybe even again after a year is because the impact of the pandemic was the sort of request. We won't know the impact of the pandemic for some months to come for some children. It'll emerge slowly. They don't just come back to school and show us. So I suspect this is a long term issue we'll be grappling with, which is why my plea would be for some support for an extra resource for Brookfield, because their demand is going to go higher and some extra resource for those youngsters preschool for whom the language delay will become a serious problem further down the line. Um, but, but I won't know in much more detail on this for another six months, I think. And I suspect the DFE and other organisations are, well, I know they are, organising their own longer longitudinal studies, which will begin to report then in a way we don't yet know. Um, so it's coming out slowly, would be my view on that. But thank you for those comments. Thank you. Thank you, Kerry. And Councillor Andrews, if you have any comments, if you want to say something, or you're, you're, you've absorbed everything that's been going. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Tongo, as the uh, lead member, is there anything you want to add to the debate? Any other comment you wish to make? No, thanks very much, but I've listened with interest to everything. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Councillor, you want to make a last point before we. Uh, yeah, it's questions. just a quick one, and it's uh, some clarification. Um, because you know there was all the stuff about us joining with it and being a joint CCG, but is uh, is the mental health care provision going to be affected by becoming integrated care systems, or does that affect a different part? This ICS plan, I'm not not clear. I don't know whether the committee's clear with me about what implications that might have for our provision for the mental health pathways. Um, Jack Wainwright again. Yeah. Um, so, in, in essence, the the ICS is is the same footprint as as the CCG sits on now. It's the same footprint as the mental health trust sits now. So, um, it, it shouldn't have a huge effect. Um, what I would say is that there is a through the work of developing the ICS, there has been a very strong voice for place, um, individual places, be those district um, collaboratives. Um, set up a, a, represented the, the six district councils in Worcestershire and certainly for Herefordshire as a place uh, as distinct from Herefordshire and Worcestershire as a whole. Um, so I, I think that I, I don't think it impacts mental health services enormously. Um, and in fact, if anything, there's a stronger voice possibly um, for Herefordshire versus the, the total ICS. Okay, okay, well, it remains to be seen, but that sounds good initially. Thank you. Councillor Kenya, um, before we leave this, can I just make one point? If you've got a child in crisis, yes, you can go to the hospital and that sort of stuff. One day with a child in crisis is one day too many. 26 weeks, half of one year is ridiculous. And I know um, the, uh, the, the lady, uh, sorry, I don't know your name, I can't remember your name has mentioned that already, but it's not good enough. We need to make sure we say it's not good enough. Half of one year. Just think about that. Half of one year. Comment, yeah. I think, Kerry, you've obviously presented the report. We've been presented with a, a mass of information and, and in the workshop this morning. Uh, we knew when we tackled this subject it wasn't going to be mm conventional and be able to grasp a few simple concepts and then raise comments about it and say, oh, where are we doing? And some recommendations. And I think probably most of us are struggling with just seeing the whole scope of the subject that we're talking about yeah. and drawing up some sensible conclusions. A question to ask you, I think a direct one, 
it's clear most authorities are probably struggling. How, how do you think we compare with similar authorities in coming to grips with it? Clearly nobody's come to grips with it as thoroughly as they might yet, but would you say honestly that we are on the curve, similar to the authorities behind or ahead of it? And, and where do you think we might be able to do better compared to some of the others? Uh, yeah, thanks, thanks Chair. I, my, my sense is it's a classic Herefordshire dilemma. I think probably the numbers we're dealing with are manageable longer term, but the capacity we've got to deal with them is always stretched. And so I would say we're pretty much in line with national. It's a national issue. It's an emerging issue as well. I, I would suggest that actually uh, the massive information that you, you've, you've grappled with today would probably suggest that we need some kind of more strategic joined up approach to this. The range of initiatives is quite complex. And it might be that we manage it slightly differently um, across the various agencies. I'm also mindful that some of the comments that have come at us um, during the afternoon are actually criticisms of national policy or national initiatives or Ofsted or something of that sort. And, and, and that's difficult, really, because schools, for example, wrestle with what Ofsted are going to ask them to do, whether we like it or not, if that makes sense. So there's a constant dilemma there. Are we ahead of the curve? I think we're at least awake to it would be the good start. And actually that list of initiatives that's come from Elaine and from Hillary today shows we are actually doing stuff. So I'm reasonably confident, but nervous of the capacity would be would be my real real answer to that, I think. That's not that's not completely a fudge, it's just the reality of where we are oh, at the no, moment, I think. You know? It's an honest answer. I think if you don't say anything else, we probably wouldn't believe <laughs> yeah, it. So but, yeah. it's fair enough. It's good to know you think we're and probably a fair assessment that we're sort of away to the curve and somewhere on it difficult mm. to actually judge and we've got a whole range of things we could look at is there something particular two or three things that you think you know what if scrutiny could help with those particular areas that we discussed today it would be quite useful um well i've made mine clear so I'm the spot, but yeah uh i'm going to bring in some colleagues who aren't schools in a minute just so they can chip in but i think from a school's perspective some of the some of the capacity issues that Hillary's alluded to in the special needs provision are real. So that would be one. And that and I include the special schools that, you know, some of you heard Michelle Parks from Brookfield talk this morning, for example. She was very eloquent about how stretched they are there, and she's right to be. Um, and then the other one is about the early years. And by early years, I might even expand that into the year one and year two issues as well. And thereby we capture a lot of the youngsters who we know are going to struggle post-pandemic. Um, uh, and we invest there to save like, further down the line. That's a bit of a business answer, but um, we do. So that would be my plea. And I, and I know there are colleagues on the call here who might have a particular plea from their own organisational perspective, including including perhaps Elaine. I don't know. I didn't mean to put you on the spot, Elaine, there, but you probably do. Um, so my, I suppose for me, before Elaine chips in, I would just finally say, look, be aware. Be aware that the special specialist provision is stretched in the county at the moment. Uh, post-pandemic and we know where the hot spot is emerging from which is the very youngest children i think it's where sorry it's the very youngest children the very, very youngest, youngest children yes, yeah. yeah sorry um, yeah. as you say i think um, the book for the school presentation this morning was particularly forceful in that respect yeah indeed uh, councillor summers wanted to make a point yeah. and then i think we need to draw the whole thing to a yeah. conclusion thank you chair for allowing me to go one more time um one of my issues with mental health is there's an awful lot out there. There's an awful lot of help out there. One of the problems with that, though, is we don't have it. It's not very well organised in my mind. It, uh, do, do, would you do you think we're spreading ourselves too thin at times with partner organisations? Um, it's just a question because we, there is an awful lot, and if if you're in crisis, where you go is a real issue because. I, I, I'm part of a men's group right now, and they get lost nine times out of ten. Um, so the, maybe there's too much, but I'm just wondering if we're spreading ourselves too thin. I know it's a tough question, but there we go. Thanks. Thank you. We we may be is my answer, and and I'm conscious of I think it was Councillor Kenyon's comment about the uh, I might get it wrong, but the 26 week wait is unacceptable. Um, that, that's not a council issue. That's a wider than a council issue, if that mm. makes sense. But but the reality of life is that's not good enough, as you say. So um, maybe maybe how we respond to urgent emerging crises for young people might be something we could look at again um, in the near future. I think we should. 
I could jump in, so it's Elaine Cook Tippins. There's massive investment coming from the long term plan to improve crisis care for children and young people. And in Herefordshire, we'll be going to a seven day home treatment service and also a 24 7 crisis response for young people um, over the next 12 months or so. There'll also be massive investment in what we're calling youth. So those young people aged 16 to 25 who sometimes get lost along the way as they're growing up and leaving home or leaving services. So I think that might be really useful to, to look at, to see how we're doing against the long-term plan ambitions. Makes sense, yeah. Do you have, you, have, you have a plan at the moment that we could use as a base point? Sorry, could Hello. you repeat that? Yeah, I said, and so you have a plan at the moment we could use as a base point then to measure progress. And how often should we do that? Every quarterly, would you say? Or is that probably too short? not every quarter, probably too, too short. Um, yeah. I will look to Jack on that actually, because Jack has to report on a regular basis, so it might be helpful to time in with that. Okay, uh, I think three months is probably a bit short. Jack, you were going to say something? Uh, sorry, yes. Um, I think three months is probably a little short. These are quite significant developments and, and a lot of preparatory work going into them. I think I think the six month timeline that's been discussed already seems reasonable. I, I think we'll, we'll be able to show real progress in that kind of time frame. And once the services are established, then then the more routine reporting um, rather, rather than kind of project delivery reporting kind of kicks in. Uh, so it can be kind of more frequent if you wished. Yeah, okay. I, I was just saying, uh, first year myself, so we can make a note to come back and say December meeting. September. 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 Yeah, September. Six months September. is September, yeah, not December. Yeah, sorry. In the September meeting, we view it, and we're making progress to the plan. So that could be our first recommendation that we say we, we agree to review the progress in the September meeting. Chair, can I make a suggestion for the September meeting? Actually, by then, I expect more national studies to come out, which are probably Herefordshire will mimic those, won't they, likely? Yeah. It might be worth asking us to pull together a kind of summary of the national surveys that are going on in this area um, for that September meeting as well. As well as a local that's one. a really good point. So we do actually have a comparison to how well we're doing. Yeah. 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 So we add that to it. Yeah. Okay, Captain that, James. Jack, I've got to get Phil. Yeah. The capture. Sorry, Hans Andrews. Yeah. Can I add one into that then? So rather than just do a comparison, can you actually tell us an action plan of how you're going to fill the gap? Because in the words have just been said, the one time six months was too long, and then we just said six months would be an ample time to give us a summary of the information. So they actually the comments conflict each other. So if three months is too short, but six months will give you ample time at six months, I'd like to see that you've summarized the areas as comparable groups and you've come forward with an action plan to say what your gaps are going to be because i'm going to stay with jim here that every time you say six months it sounds like it's ample time it's too long you, you can't say six months is long enough in one sentence and then six months is too short in another we should just agree that six months is too long yeah. and you've got to make it shorter so in september what I would expect to see, please, is a summary of what the comparable groups are and then also what the Herefordshire Action Plan is to be in front of those groups and not just be part of them. And I'm really sorry, if you think that's too too hard, then you need to get more up with stuff and get things done quicker because that is not acceptable for what we require. Um, it needs to be punchier and it needs to be quicker. Actually, Cantando is quite right. What we said right at the beginning that we want to see how well we're doing, what the gaps are and yeah, how we're absolutely. filling them. Or how are we going to fill those gaps here? You're reminding us, that's what we said. One of the things we wanted to make sure we're seeing in future. So I think we've got a, a firm okay. recommendation. Yeah. A number of points to it. Kerry, sorry. Yes, yeah, sorry. I don't think I did say three months was too short and six months was too long. I think that came from several different organisations. Um, but I'll take your point. What you're really yeah. interested in is a plan to address what, what we think the issues are by then. Um, yeah, that's right. I, I think the issue for me with some of this is that there, there are different organizations presenting here on this this kind of content with, with, yeah. with different timelines <laughs> that really complicates the whole situation and yeah. drawing, drawing firm conclusions so this one where we can come back in six months review how we are where the gaps are how we compare to our neighbors and what we should do about it an important element of the september meeting and probably the most significant conclusion we can draw from the debate um, is, I, I just want to correct, uh, sort of come back at this because 
we all know that for a child to have a mental health difficulty for six months before they're, they're actually seen by a professional is unacceptable. But that's not us. That's not the local authority, is it? No. So how do we drive um, you know, service provision and resource for CAMS as a local authority? That's my question. How do we do it? Do we lobby government? Do CCG. We do we lobby the CCG, the CCG or the ICS as they're transforming to be? Do we say, I mean, I, there must be so many authorities in the same situation. You know, saying that our key performance indicator were in line with it and 26 weeks is acceptable with a tsunami of, of you know, mental health difficulties coming down the line from the pandemic is really a big car crash. Mm. So I think as a local authority, we need to be pushing. David Summers has got an idea. Yeah, I just, my figures could be wrong, but I seem to remember that the substantial funding came into Herefordshire for GP practices. Now, I also understand that funding went to, was is being controlled by MIND. It came through council and now being controlled by MIND. Now, I don't see a lot of work being done in GP practices, to be frank. Now, because GP press are having their own problems and uh, they're, they're really suffering too. So that funding that came in from central government for GP practices to get mental health in GP practices, do we know what's happening with that? Thank you. If I could respond to that one, uh, Jack went around again. Um, th there are a few different strands. Uh, I think by Herefordshire your mind, you're referring to the community mental health transformation, which is the, the adult community mental health transformation. Um, which we obviously haven't addressed today, but happy to do it, you know, another time. Um, they are, if you think about the size of the team um, versus, you know, covering the whole of Herefordshire, they are offering some limited capacity within practices, but actually many of the practices are not are not able to accommodate um, other, other professionals, other mental health professionals in their practices um, or, or they're working at a different unit. So, so Hereford and Mind work at a Hereford typically as well. And they've got more than one site there. Um, there is, there are other roles coming through as well, which definitely will, will be employed directly by practices um, and, and obviously will be based in practices as well. And they'll be um, funded jointly between practices and the Health and Care Trust, um, the CCG funding as well. So there's a few different strands of it. Um, I think it, it is adults, but it should become more visible um, in the next three to six months, I think. But as I say, that, that's ad adults, really, um, which is why we haven't really addressed it today. OK, but this has been 12 months. This money's been here as far as I know. I don't see a lot happening. But from what I understand, there's three GP practices that have received money for this. I'm not sure if that's a fact, but that's what I understand to be from the Herefordshire Worcester committee that I'm on. But it still, you know, it still seems to be a long time before something is showing. Now, I don't know where to put the blame, uh, if there is any blame at all. But I think the money was fairly substantial. We got more than Worcester did, uh, as far as I, rem if I remember correctly. And I'm a little disappointed in, in what's happened with it so far. So um, I know it's for adults, but if if it if it's being fitted into GPs for adults, then children would automatically come in too. I would think so. I would really like to know what's happened with that money, how it's been spent, and maybe if we can get to that some other time, I'd like it. I'd like to find out. Thank you. Okay, let's try and draw this to a um, conclusion. We've already got this um, first comment about how we would come back in September and review. And also, I think we need to ask Kerry your point about you did say that this isn't a structured report, and we ought to come back with a more meta methodological one in six months, so that would tie in. What we said about the other conclusions that we've drawn, so we should add that to it. I suggest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You agree with that? Yeah. 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 Thank you, Matthew. Uh, Matthew chair, Hansen. Chair, you've got two hands up. You've got Sonny Ann Osborne, who's hands up for a while, and Councillor Fagan. Sorry, I can't see them from here. Thank you for reminding me. Councillor Fagan, I, did you want to add anything? Um, well, I, I would be interested to to hear what uh, Sally Ann Osborne said, but actually, Chair, uh, my, my issue is that I was wondering whether we should uh, call for a spotlight review or a task and finish, possibly to look at uh, issues around how we press for more funding to support uh, schools, parents and teachers. 
Um, also, uh, as far as I understand, the capacity issues within the um, SENDs uh, is that that is sort of being being looked at, obviously by the council staff. But is there something that we can do to to put extra pressure on that to um, to, to gain extra support. And also, uh, one of the things that I, I really feel we need to look at is the um, enrichment development for the very young, uh, how how we actually support the, the, the very young and in, involve these enrichment activities. It's very clear that they have um, had a significant impact. Um, do we need to investigate sort of you know what that impact is so that we can put more pressure on to draw down more funding for more of that kind of activity uh, for the for the young so so that was what i wanted to say thank you yes i was going to raise that as one of the other issues we should put into our for our recommendations you and uh, councillor ken you both raised the importance of um, supporting activities enrichment of life in the way you say i think definitely we should include that as an area we should and I like your idea of a task and finish group do members agree with that that's something we should set up to look at okay can we capture that in our list of recommendations then James John I think Councillor Kenyon also had a recommendation we were going to come back to uh, at the start of the discussion I don't, yeah. don't know if Councillor Kenyon wants to indeed yeah you had one didn't you Jen that is, we said you could you could recommend even though you can't vote on it it's going to come yeah, back to that you might have to raise it that was ages ago yeah, but we made a recommendation. Written down something that I didn't. It's about chasing the money. Can you remember school, what it's school, really? So when were, the, when were the pupil? No, yeah. my brain's all full. <laughs> yeah, so... Yeah, thank you, thank you. I did write it down. Yeah, it, it's it's about if a, a child's excluded from the school, the money needs to follow straight away. The money Not, follows the child. It, the money follows the child. Yeah. That was the one, yeah, money following the... Yeah, that was it. I, I wrote that down to say we should make sure we... Capture that. I thought you'd write it down to remind me to be fair. Thank you. I did. I did write it down. Yeah, I was chairman would would say, Can you come back with the wording? But yes, we need to um, ensure that we can make sure the money follows the child promptly. We got Matthew. Matthew Sampson. You, you've still got Sally. Sally, yes, I've got that. Yes. Who, his hand came up in response to one of the points, I think, uh, quite a while ago. Sally, Sally, we, we haven't missed you. It's just there's a lot of information coming in lots of directions. What did you want to say? Your time. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So Sally Ann Osborne from the Health and Care Trust. I just wanted to give some reassurance regarding children and young people in crisis um, and waiting six, six months for assessment and treatment. Um, I can assure you that they don't wait six months. Um, they are seen much faster. Um, if a child actually presents uh, in crisis and in A&E, they are assessed uh, very timely and uh, with support wrapped around them to identify their needs. If they're not, hopefully, presenting in crisis in A&E, again, an urgent referral, there will be liaison with the young person, with the family, uh, to determine their needs and that level of, of sort of crisis acuity and what needs to happen. The, um, if where a child is not urgent, they absolutely have a need, then they may, they will wait a longer period of time. Um, and I do accept whether a young person's in crisis or not. For a parent, for a carer, actually every day is, is, is too many. Um, but I wanted to give you that reassurance regarding a child in crisis not waiting six months. Thank you very much, Sally. So I think we've got three firm recommendations then. John, would you like to? Uh, I will do my best, Chair. Yeah, yeah, well, some well, of, some of the wordsmithing sure. probably needs yeah. um, uh, yeah. working on. But um, so we have the recommendation from <laughs> Councillor Kenyon um, that if or when a child is excluded from a school, the money follows the child promptly so they're special or mental health needs are addressed quickly. Promptly, did you say? Promptly, yeah. yes. Yes. And I think we should include in that as well, lobbying the CCG for more camps funds as a part of the money process. Can we put a real time into that rather than promptly? A real time. Real time? Sorry. Yeah. Can we put a real time into that rather than just saying promptly? Yes, indeed. So that actually has a proper time, so it's like three, four weeks or two, three days or something. Because promptly is, is generous. Yeah. 
Okay, well, I, when, when, how quickly does money normally follow, and how is it delayed if it doesn't go? If well, it, it waits till the end of the year on occasions or a term. So, what, what would be a time date? Three weeks, a week? Was well, it a month? I think would be that. Month. Month. If you've got someone on day within a month. Within a month, month. You should follow. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. Thanks, Andrews. And yeah, we can add that in. We should put time scales in. Mm -hmm. Look, I know it's not a mandate at the moment, but GP practices, it covers everything. And I would still like to know what's, what's happening with mental health and GP practices. You know, we've got about three GP practices that, that may have mental health services, and there's it's been worked on for a year. We, you know, it's going to help everybody, especially with the all ages thing we're looking at in May. Big, big question. I don't think we've got time to discuss that today, but let's no, come no, to but, uh, it. We yeah. need let's come back to it. Come back, come back to, to it. it. We must come back to it. We'll come to that in the notes to come back to it. Matthew Sampson. Uh, Chair, isn't that a request to be made to adult scrutiny to, to have a look at, for adults to have a look at what's happening with that? Cause well, it'd be both, I think, wouldn't it? It, it could be a joint one. I think one, it's yeah. an all ages commissioning. Yeah, yeah. It's all ages coming yeah. in May. Let's make a note we need to explore that subject and that, uh, about how doctors' practices and how they're coping with it. And it, it will obviously potentially be a joint discussion. Councillor Kenyon. Oh, it's given up, mate. Um, probably used it too much today. Um, just the chairman to follow up on the CCG funding for mental health, the breakdown between Herefordshire and... That's what I just said. If we add that to the task and finish group looking at money transfer, we can also look at... Well, I think the chap on, on here today has been listening to that and will be preparing that and send it to you. You can just send it out. You don't okay, yeah. To. Right, maybe. Okay, a separate item then. Um, so, you, you, you mentioned one point. No. Second point. Uh, so the second recommendation I think I've captured is around the work programme, uh, which is a report is prepared to review the progress of the uh, at the Children and Young People Scrutiny Committee in September, including national comparator data. Um, sorry, bear with me. And and a report to the committee about what action planning Herefordshire is considering to address the problems within our county. Yeah, it's a more meth methodological structured plan than the current one. I think was the word that Kerry used. Um, just on that, folks, I'm, I'm assuming the national comparative data will be available by yes. then. I have no control over that, of course. So, yeah, I'm expecting it to be. Fingers crossed you will explain yeah. why if not. So that, that's the third recommendation. John, I think there's one more. Uh, so I've actually got five, but okay, you can you can shoot them down if, if yeah. they're not correct. So, so Councillor Hay um, proposed, and I've jotted it as a recommendation for the committee con to consider that a review be undertaken and a report be prepared on the impact of COVID enrichment initiatives, including the West programme, um, and the analysis provided to the committee on the longer term impacts of COVID on the state of mental health in a wider range of school settings across Herefordshire. Councillor Hay, does that capture your recommendation adequately? Um, I think the last bit was a bit muddled. Um, I, um, I probably would look to someone else to tighten that up a bit in terms of uh, a specific aim, but certainly I'd like to know, um, and I hopefully the uh, committee agree, that it'd be good to get a, a bit more detail on the, um, the, um, the actual initiatives, monies that has gone to specific projects and schools and the number of schools involved really I think that's what a lot of my question was centered around which schools have been involved in these these um, initiatives and and why really some feedback on on how why how did they access it in terms of was it they knew about it did all schools know about it and you know um, so I think it's <laughs> so I say I may need to look to someone else I'm, I'm looking at Emily there um no just to sort of um tighten that up in terms of a tangible um, recommendation as it were. We'll work and tighten it up and check it with you before we publish it. Is that okay? Yes, yeah, we can do that. Okay, Councillor okay. Hewitt. Um, well, I, Kath, I was just going to come back to your, your recommendation and say, do we want to recommend that all pandemic babies have um, uh, guaranteed access to speech and language enrichment activities? Do we want to recommend that? I mean, I don't know what the committee think about that, but, you know, we have to make sure that that happens. Right. We have, because otherwise we're going to have trouble later down the line. Can, is that a, a recommendation that will sit well with no. the committee? Maybe. I feel this, they've all gone off. Oh. I feel this goes back to perinatal. Uh, they should be keeping 
some some information on that. There, there's, I know in about a three month span, they were seeing about a hundred mothers. This was pre pre pandemic or pre COVID. So what they've got now, I don't know, but I'm sure they would have some that we could bring them into. Anyway, it's that it's out there. It should be. Yeah, we can go at that point, Councillor Kenyon. Uh, are we treading on um, health um, toes here? Because this is already done with, with, when people go along, the health visitors and all that sort of stuff go along. They will see if there's an issue and then they will report it up, up the chain. I think us trying to weigh in there is that uh, we don't know what's us. happening. Sorry, check. And it's Lindsay McCarty from Public yes. Health here. May, yes. I, may I jump in a second? Public Please. Health Commissions, Health Visiting and School Nursing on behalf of the Council and Hannah Bannister-White is, is our lead, uh, operational lead for health visiting. She'd be very happy to, to, to answer some, some of that just now. Okay, uh, Heather, would you like to do that? So yeah, of course. So um, in regards to um, speech and language therapy, um, as a commission service, we see children at nine months and again at two years for development reviews. So in essence, we will um, review communication, gross motor skills, a whole range of, of um, development kind of targets. Um, and at those sessions, what we'll do is if we pick up any speech and language difficulty then for that child, we then subsequently review to our colleagues in speech and language therapy. We also put in some support from our own service in terms of our community nursery nurses they're able to go in and do some work you know for a period of kind of six to eight weeks to support the parent in play ideas think you know and, and ideas that will support that child's communication so we do get in there and, and we are seeing our children face to face in children's centers um, within the community in their homes um, to make those assessments and those observations we also work closely um, with our, our nursery colleagues as well um, in that respect um, so yes so we do pick up um, those children that may need some additional support at that stage. Okay, thank you. That's your question, okay, Councillor Summers? Yeah. Right. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that. We've got five recommendations. We're going to tidy up some of the detail. Yeah. Um, can I have a one of the voting members vote that we accept those recommendations? Councillor Summers, seconder. Okay. Councillor Andrews, all in favour. There are five of us who could vote. Agreed, yeah. Chair, may I, may I just um, ask then that when um, James and I reword Smith the, the, the yes. uh, uh, recommendations that all of the committee agree that they're happy with that wording yeah. on the basis yeah, of... I, 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 I already, well, I made a commitment to yes, yes, I yes. meant to all the committee we will make sure everybody's happy Fine. before we publish it. I'm Thank sorry, Councillor Hiles, but I, I have one last recommendation and it's, it relates to this... Don't be sorry, um, if it's a good one, we'll take it. It relates to this attendance um, officer so, you know, there's a proposal which we have to take up of 100, um, you know, two attendance or non-attendance officers. But somebody, and I can't remember who it was, and our, an officer said that there's going to be an emotionally based non-attendance project. So could we use that money to boost this initiative? That's my, that's my recommendation that we use, we look to using that 100k for two attendance officers to link it with the emotionally based non-attendance project. Which which officer was talking about that? That was me, Hilary Jones. Hilary Jones. Yeah. So, so so that's the educational psychologist. That's specifically around um, young people with autism whose anxiety means that they're no longer attending school. Okay, that's so that's currently what the project. So I my worry would be that we wouldn't have the resource to extend that offer beyond that cohort of young people because um, because there's a national shortage of educational psychologists. So we would spread it too thinly. So whilst I appreciate and think that's a fantastic idea, because I think to get an education, an educational psychology based sort of um, model to get all children back into school would be fantastic. But we might be able to look at a model possibly where um, the attendance officers are supervised by an EP and do it that way so that they're so that they are supervised and have um, that sort of trauma informed attachment based sort of way of working rather than just beating kids and their parents with a stick get to school get to school or we'll fine you. Um, that's exactly but, what I was looking for. Um, okay, I think you've answered that very well. Thank okay, you. Okay, so I yeah, I think that's probably the 
best we could probably try and do at the moment. Okay. Well, I'm going to suggest on the agenda we've got still a few more items, including the work programme. And, and uh, Rebecca, you haven't had a chance to speak to a report yet. I'm certainly fair we should give you a chance, even if it's only a quick review of it. So I'm going to suggest that the work programme, we have a, we've been having a meeting on that, that the Vice Chair, myself, and uh, Matthew, that we send a report back to members on the suggested work programme for next meetings as soon as possible, rather than discuss it today. And we, have, we give Rebecca a chance to give a quick presentation of the report so we get a bit more understanding of the issues you'd like to explain to us. Would members agree with that? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, can I just recommend that the work programme before it goes out gets amended with the recommendation that uh, the task and finish group because that wasn't on the original work programme that we discussed and if it's a recommendation from today I think so yeah. if that goes on so, go on the work so the members are aware that it's, it's, it's yeah. added to the work programme which was circulated. Yeah, thanks for yeah. Apologies Chair, sorry I've had my hand up for a, a little bit, can can I just ask a question? Of course you can't tell you. I'm sorry, uh, I've been looking and I can't see it. No, it's fine, it's fine. It, it, not telling me. It's just on the, on the issues of funding, I mean we did talk about uh, contacting the DfE about the um, the the issues that have been raised today, and uh, and the question of uh, the the drop in funding that schools are experiencing at a time when actually they're going to need increased funding to deal with these issues. And I'm just not sure if if we if if that got included in the in the recommendations, but it, I would request that it is. Yeah, one of our recommendations is about looking at funding, so we can make sure the wording includes that. Do you agree with that, John? We can do that. We will. But the, the dropping in funding and part of the task and finish group activities will be to investigate that as well. Okay, yeah. Is that, would thank that satisfy Tony, your point? Thank Great, thank you. Are there any more hands if I can't see any? Jen? Harry. Just, Chair, just, just a final comment from me about funding, really. In the, in the report, I made reference to £100,000 for two attendance offices. That money does not exist. There is no money here. That right. money was what it would cost if we were to appoint them. So if we go ahead with that, then well, somehow we've got to find the money somewhere. And thank you, Councillor Fagan, for your suggestion to talk to the DfE about funding it. That, that's a huge question for the DfE. They will not say yes to me if I go and ask them that, because what you're in effect asking is for them to fund the school system properly when we all know they don't does that make sense so it's a worthy aim but what they tend to do is offer funding for specific projects now we can approach them for some of that if that makes sense but they define the projects first rather than us go with with a bid usually so the, the funding here is is still remains a complete a complete stretch to be blunt um so we've now got to go and find some if we can spend it and we're not quite sure where it was going to come from and the dfe will be probably unhelpful in that regard because they take the view schools are funded adequately and we disagree and but they take that view does that make sense so uh, we do talk to them weekly we do involve ourselves with their initiatives and schemes and we do try and get as much money from the dfe as we can but, but to go and ask the DfE, will you fund schools adequately, which is in, in effect is what we're suggesting there, they think they do already. So there's a there's, there has to be a healthy dose of realism around this, folks. They, they're not yeah. going to say yes to that. They just need you, you to be aware of that. Yeah. yeah. Um, is it, could it be counted as part of the improvement plan? Some of this need, do you think? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm hoping it will, will be my answer to that, yes. Well, obviously, the local government association are supporting us and scrutiny, particularly, and being more yeah. effective in scrutiny, yeah. and maybe we can. Could be something we could help through the LGA to yes. the FE to get some funding for something we think is an important part of the improvement plan. That yeah. might work. Yeah, that's a good route through, Chair. I, I think that's very welcome. Thank you very much. Any support you might be able to offer in that regard is really what the ask is today, I think. Right. Great. Thank you. So I want to make sure we finish at 5.30. So can we um, ask um, Rebecca to give us a quick summary of your report? We've all read it. We've got it. Would you like Matthew. to do... Matthew, you want yeah. to add something? Sorry, I'm trying to move us on. But no, I'll, I'll, I'll be very quick, but I'm conscious of asking the DfE, as Kerry said, for money is probably not a, a wide, but lobbying your own MPs who can lobby their own... Um, lobby, lobby maybe the route go around. Is it, is, yeah, we could have a number of attempts at doing it. Is it, is it really through individual councillors, or would you say if you lobby the MP as scrutiny? 
Have you got the game for your scrutiny? Okay. As a representative of your view, that's your Okay. To be honest, I think this group has a powerful voice with local MPs, so I think yeah. come as a group to them would be yeah. my, my yeah. request. Sorry, is there still money coming in from the legal aspect? No, I think all that that's all being used up. I think well, the question is, has any of that money still not been used from coming into the legal support? But I think that's all been allocated. I'm pretty sure I'm right in saying that. Yeah, yeah, that's you know. Know. Ruth, you might know. I don't know. I don't think there's any spare money from the money we're already getting, is there? No, not that I'm aware of, Chair. Okay. No, thank you. Uh, um, Rebecca, we, thank you. Obviously um, to read the report. we've got a few minutes in which we can at least give you a chance. You can sit in there patiently all day. I'm sorry, it's a much bigger subject than even we realise. But to give you a bit of time to at least give us the work you've been doing, I think would be a courtesy to you. So would you like to give us a summary of your report, please? Um, sure, thank you. Um, and, and yeah, I think it, 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 I won't show the slides, but we'll just pick up on a couple of things um, uh, outlining it. And thank I think it, it's um, it's just taken what we've kind of talked about, I think, so far is some of that, sort of, you know, that detailed work in, in schools, that overarching picture and some of the specialist services around camps. And this is kind of, you'll see in the report that kind of taking it back a level, I suppose, and kind of looking at some of those risk factors and preventative uh, protective factors that can support children and recognizing that you know it's a, it's a child within the family within the school within the community and there's activities and aspects of all of those uh, at all of those levels that impact on on their um on the risk really i suppose uh, and the resilience uh, around their sort of uh, mental health and 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 future uh, mental health and risk factors around mental health um, I think if I just very quickly talk about some of the work we've been doing around data, not pulling out the actual outcomes, if you like, because you can all see that in the report, but just sort of recognising where, where that comes from. And then I'll hand over to Lindsay and Hannah to talk a little bit more about actually the kind of some of that, just touching on some of that universal and um, preventative work that that um, that helps around that, around those protective factors. Um, so I think just wanted to highlight in terms of where our understanding of, of children, young people's mental health comes from, and you'll, you'll find in the report some of the links um, through to various reports we've done, looking at you know the DPH report, which pulled out the impacts on on, on uh, of the virus in terms of the uh, the virus itself, but then also the uh, impact on access to services, followed by obviously all the aspects we've been talking about here in terms of the control measures and children not being in school, children not having that social contact. Um, and that they, the real inequalities on, on those aspects, they've hit some families and some children much harder than others. I've had things like poverty. So our, our understanding comes both from national evidence, as Kerry's touched on, we'll, we'll see that come through more and more. We can't know at the moment what the full impact of, of the pandemic and, and the control measures have been, but we will start to see that come through more and more. The really One of the really great pieces of work that's been undertaken by um, by lots of partners and led by the research team and Herefordshire Council, um, but actually run by the Schools Health and Education Unit, which is a, um, a special, who specialise in this type of research, was actually looking at a survey of children and young people, um, turned their quality of life survey, touched on a whole load of topics, including around um, uh, emotional health and well-being, but actually all of those perfect protective factors as well. So how you know how they're feeling in their family, whether they have that trusted adult linking through to how they feel about in their school, the, the bullying aspects in school, and then how they fit in their community, their aspects, as we talked about here, all their, you know, that link to the physical activity um, and those those wide protective services. So it's a great survey and kind of surveyed nearly nearly 5,000 children. We haven't got the, the, the comparative question is a really good one. I understand Worcestershire are doing their study at the moment and other areas are are starting to pick up these types of surveys. So in due course, we should have uh, further comparative data. And obviously when the survey was undertaken, great care was, was taken to make sure that where we ask questions that there'll be, you know, there is, it is possible to benchmark around. And those, those surveys have been shared. Yeah, with... Sorry, one of the councillors raised his hands to ask a question, Councillor Kenyon wanted to ask you a question. Thank you, Ewan. you're in full flow there. And it's interesting stuff, you know. Um, during the pandemic, a lot of children now are using social media and the likes of TikTok and the, the pressures and the bullying, online bullying. We all know the issues in and around that. Um, I, the police obviously lead on the on the worst side of this, 
um, and you know, the, the groom inside and all the rest of it. But I think there may well be um, a, a, somewhere where local government can look into social media side of things for the schools, where the schools perhaps can monitor some of the children. I've got a daughter of 10. Uh, she isn't on TikTok. She did join it. Um, she soon came off it as soon as I saw it. But um, the pressures that these young children are put onto, which then leads to the grooming, sexual exploitation, and all of this. This is something that's very, very serious. I think the local government should be getting a handle on this, liaising with the police that do the really, really nasty stuff, and I take my hat off to them. Um, but the, the, we should be in there doing something. That's my feeling. Yeah, a good comment. Did the survey make any, give us any indication of findings on, on those subjects? Um, um, yes, you'll see, um, I don't know what's, what page it is actually, but there's, there's a slide in there which talks about links and connections between uh, uh, some, some risk factors and, and trusted adults. And you can see that actually the bottom of that is a percentage of children that have been pressurised into sending a picture or showing something on a webcam. Um, and you can see there the sort of impact of a protective factor. So 7% of those with a, with a trusted adult um, compared to 21% who didn't have didn't have that trusted add-on. Obviously, that that's twenty-one percent of a much much smaller number, um, but it's still still a concern. Um, yes, 63. and I think it takes sixty-three that those want to look at here. Yes, I, I saw that, Chairman. But, yeah. but the, the thing is, they see their, their their friends doing a little dance and this sort of stuff, and they they feel pressured into doing all that sort of stuff. This peer pressure, and I think we need to kind of get a grip of this with TikTok. I'm picking on in particular, but there are other um, platforms that that do just this and I'd like to see um, local government taking more of a look into this because this is very serious this leads on to the mental health issues it leads on to abuse and 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 all the like so um, that's my suggestion and recommendation perhaps going going forward I'm sure you've noted that Rebecca sorry to interrupt carry on please quite right thank you yes no absolutely noted and um, what I was going to and Kim Flo was saying it's actually the schools have had the individual reports back around around the survey so they can you know have that that detailed data to be able to look at it and we're just starting to really get to the bottom of it and share that obviously with colleagues across and, and pulling out things like you just said there and actually what what can we do about it really conscious of time so I'm going to hand over to um, Lindsay and Hannah to flow through there. some of the next bit if that's okay thank you very much thank you to say Hannah's um, struggling to get back into the meeting. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Hannah, that, Jen? Hannah, Hannah is struggling Hannah. to get back into the meeting. Oh, is she? So oh, she dropped out, did she? Yeah, okay. So we haven't got Hannah. It seems Rebecca. Uh, you've got Lindsay McCarty here from Public Health. Um, I'll, I'll leave talking about the Public Health Nursing Service till we can see if Hannah can rejoin. Um, okay. Just to pick up on, on, on issues around potentially around child exploitation, there is a child exploitation a subgroup looking at all aspects of exploitation um, through the Herefordshire Children's Safeguarding Board. Uh, obviously, the council are, are a key partner in um, and looking at social media and abuse and recruiting into, into those kinds of um, unhealthy relationships if you like is is is, is 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 a current piece of work at the moment so to, just to let you know that that is happening um in terms of some of the specific pieces of work uh the solly hull approach it's actually also come up already um in in um through some of hillary's uh, presentation which is online um and face-to-face uh, -face training which is available for both professionals but also parents um carers, families, friends, and it's all around pr pr protecting um, children, trying to enhance relationships between parents and children, helping parents understand children's behavior and improve relationships within families. Um, it's, a, it's an evidence-based approach, uh, and we have been lucky enough to be part of a whole kind of extended uh, pilot program we have an online license that we've bought so parents can access online training if they can't access um, online they can be supported by either professionals through for example children's center services or health visitors um, or schools indeed uh, to, to, to work through some of the modules 
And there are a whole range of modules uh, covering understanding your child, understanding your baby. There is the one on the teenage brain, which, which was mentioned earlier. Uh, and the teenage brain uh, course is available both for parents and, and there's a specific one for teenagers themselves to do. Uh, so they're, they're developing these materials all the time. Um, the Solihull approach is based um, at, an, at, a, at a Solihull um, educational institution. Um, and we've also developed a kind of trainer training model within the county. So we offer multidisciplinary training because we think that the professionals learn really, really well from each other. So health visitors are, are doing the training with social workers, we've had teachers, we've had children's centre workers, early, early years support workers, nursery staff, uh, we've actually had staff from Hoople. So it, the, the, the training is available to a whole range of, of, of those who have involvement with families and children. Um, and the, uh, the, the online courses are, are free. So within the slides, there's a, a yellow slide which talks about the Solihull uh, training program. If you sign up um, during pregnancy, for example, to do, to do a course, you can then follow courses all the way through to understanding the teenage brain uh, for, for nothing. Um, so, so actually it's a really, really good resource. And I would encourage any, anybody um, this afternoon, if you haven't had a, 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 a go, <coughs> do try and do one of the modules because they're, they're, they're full of really insightful and useful information. And we're looking to, we've done a lot of work with primary schools uh, around Solihull, but we're looking now um, to develop this around the teenage brain because it is such a powerful tool. Thank you, we've got a question from Councillor Hewitt. Yeah, so this, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a very sad point to make, but I, I think it needs to be made that we all as councillors uh, discovered death by PowerPoint and I was talking to a parent recently and um, you know you can uh, go online and look like you're following a PowerPoint and tick the boxes but be doing something completely other and unfortunately the Solihull approach was where dear little Arthur Living Joe, Joe Hughes um, suffered so badly where they used this approach and you know, I don't think uh, that approach on its own. When I talked to Ruth Madembo about this, she said we're trying to move to a more trauma-informed approach and to rely less strongly on the Soho approach. So I'd, I'd like to hear your reflections about that, please. Sorry, I didn't catch all of that, but I'll try and answer as best I, I can. Um, the Solihull approach obviously isn't the, 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 the be all and end all, but it's an important element. Um, we have looked at, at, at whether or not it can be adapted. So for example, we've got some work that's been running now for about a year with um, teenage parents, young parents under the age of, of 21. Um, and there are elements of the Solihull approach which are used within that, but actually some of the some of the work is also adapted. Um, there are there are a number of different parenting programs around. Um, so there's a triple P parenting program. There's positive parenting. There are a number of different approaches. This one is evidence based, and I take your point entirely. You know, you you you, you can feel like you've 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 done a course and you've ticked the boxes, um, but but actually. I suppose the, the point is, particularly for those who, who might struggle a bit to do that, um, if you've got some support to, to work through it, then it's, it's much more powerful. It's a bit like handing somebody a leaflet and just saying, there you go, we've cracked it now. Actually, it's always better if you've got someone to talk it through with you. Councillor Hewitt's got a point back on that. So I'd like, I'd like to think about, um, you know, resourcing as far as this concerned. I mean, I'm sure that not having children's centres and having online approaches like this is, um, you know, regarded as a, as a cost efficiency. You're reaching supposedly a large range of people. But there isn't a substitute on the days when you're feeling completely overstretched to having a place where you can go and get a cup of tea and your child is playing happily with other children in a supervised area. That is absolutely, and I would like to see this committee look at some comparisons with this approach and with 
you know, say the approach in Bromyard, which has the children's centre, which is something we were going to look at anyway, but, um, you know, I think it's invest to save, and down the line, you'd get a better result rather than having an online training programme. I mean, I, I, I understand that, you know, I'm sure some of it are really good, like the teenage brain and this and the other, but, you know, those things are accessible if you've got capacity, and if actually you're overstretched, you know, your own brain feels like a teenage brain when you're watching a teenage brain presentation. Okay, that's the end of it. Sorry, I wouldn't want the committee to misunderstand that this is this is an alternative to face to face provision or children's centre services provision, um, drop in groups or um, you know opportunities for parents to meet with other parents or professionals or frontline workers. Um, this is in addition to that, um, and the the online work is really so you could take your time, do stuff at home, do it with a partner or a friend. Um, it's it's absolutely not instead of face to face communications. Thank you. That's reassuring. Before we move on, we're about to come to the end of our three hours. Oh, I think we're allowed to go on a bit longer, aren't we? Are our members happy to come and say another fifteen minutes to finish this report and see if we want to draw any conclusions from it? Yeah, are we okay with that? People online, are you okay with that? Kerry and your team, are you okay to hang on for up to 15 minutes? Yeah, yeah, fine. Thanks. Thank you very much. Matthew, you wanted to make a point. Yeah. Sorry, Chair, come to our answer. We've got another hand raised. Yeah, and Matthew, I do a hand up too. Yes, Chair. Um, two things. Can I just support um, Lindy McArdle? The, the Solihull model is just one of several models that we use, and it doesn't take a place around face to face. And face to face is really important. But we're also looking at developing family hubs. So the whole concept is about more face to face activity and doing these events in those situations. And I think it's like everything, what we've got to do is identify the right course to suit the right um, uh, family and the right child to make sure the best outcome. So it's a, it's a mixture of a, a combination. I think that would be fair, Lind Lindsay, yeah? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Anson, your hands up then, Councillor Kenyon. Oh yes, thank you. I was just saying how much um, are you engaging with the faith communities um, and and working with them because they're going to be even more important with the influx of, of people that we're going to have the refugees um, because they can do a lot but they need they need help faith communities need help from from people like you absolutely um and and i suppose that links with the 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 other kind of area to, to talk about which is around talk community and also with what matthew's just said um about developing hubs and and delivering hubs uh so at the moment our, our offer around talk community is a universal one to support communities to connect communities and to help people network with each other and some of that will be with with small voluntary organizations uh, or, or even with some of the larger national ones. Uh, so uh, there's been a cross directorate kind of initiative looking to develop some family hubs as well. So currently we've got 52 talk community hubs established across the county and we're looking to develop um, to develop a number more. I think there are actually 16 already in the pipeline over and above uh, that 52. Uh, and some of the kinds of work that's going on to support children and families um, to date has been around the holiday activity funds, which also links in with a lot of our voluntary sector communities. So there were 15 up and running for uh, the summer holidays uh, earlier this uh, earlier last year. Uh, there are there are several more um, organisations who are keen to take part in the holiday activities fund coming up for Easter. Um, and the families are also um, as, as well as the, the Holiday Activities Fund, which provides meals and activities for, for children, debt advice is being provided to, to, to families and there's a community grants funding uh, offer that's available too. 
Uh, there's a Let's Talk Children and Families survey that's just been undertaken with a thousand responses. I don't have the results to date, uh, but that, that they will be available very soon. And the whole point of that was that to ask our families, what would you like in terms of help and support from your communities? What would you like in terms of early help? What kind of information do you want? Where would you go for information? Um, who, who, who do you want the information from and how do you want it? Um, so I think some of that survey results, uh, those results will, will, will be very useful in terms of, 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 of developing services further. Um, Information uh, resource on the Talk Community uh, Directory is being redeveloped at the moment in relation to children and young people's emotional health and well-being. So all of the work that, um, well, most of it, I, th I think that we've been talking about today will be reflected on there, as well as voluntary sector agencies, um, CUTH, all of that work, MIND, CLD Trust, all of that is, is listed on the directory uh, and will be enhanced as we, as we, we develop that. Uh, and in terms of COVID recovery specifically, there was a Green Spaces grant, which has provided funding to communities. And of the 24 community areas that, that, that requested support, half of them were for play areas for their children uh, in their area. A gym membership was provided free of charge to year 11 to 13s. Um, I'm not sure how long that was for, but certainly it was started uh, up for, for the summer holidays. Uh, and I, I, I'm not sure if it's extended throughout the, um, the academic year. I think it probably has up to Easter uh, because the COVID recovery funding had been available to, to the end of this month. Um, and uh, I know swimming lessons came up earlier and there probably are some issues around it, uh, but 900 free swimming lessons uh, were, were, were taken up uh, through, the, through the summer holidays and into the autumn. So children are accessing some physical activity as well to support mental health and well-being. And I'm not going to go into the public health. Sorry, is it Sally who's speaking? Lindsay. Lindsay, sorry, Lindsay, I couldn't see the name. Lindsay, uh, Councillor Kenny put his hand up a while ago and didn't want to interrupt you, but he, he had a question to ask. So come here, ask him. Apologies. Yes. So, uh, hey, no worries, Lindsay. I've got a question, I've got an observation um, and a plea. Um, so you spoke earlier about a course, um, take the take up. How many actually take up the course? And how many are pushed into it? And how many are told by social services, or oh, you have to do this course? You know? Because um, I'm, I'm here three hours in, I'm enthusiastic, I'm willing, I want to be here. But if you've told you have to do a course, um, you're not going to be very engaging. So have you got some figures, actual figures around that, please? Um, and I'll just go on to the, um, the, 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 I'm very proud to be chairman of Hinton Community Centre and we do a fit and fed at the boxing club. Um, we've done a lot of these initiatives right away from the start. Um, talk community want to hang on our short tails a little bit and we let them. So here's a plea to you. We need a new roof. It's 40 grand. We've got 20 grand. Let the council find 20 grand to get a roof on there so we can continue to do the work you're talking about. So we need 20 grand. Go and find it. Point taken, I'm sure. Uh, Lindsay, I'm sure you'll take that on board. Anything Thank else you, you want to add for us as part of your presentation? Thank you. Yep. Just very briefly, there are some figures around the Solihull take up um, in the slide set. Nobody is forced to do the to do the programme at all. It is very much about trying to support parents, and we know that everybody's different, so not everybody will want want to do that. So actually, if you've got uh, say an early um, early help support worker with you. They, they will take elements of, of the programme and actually just speak with people about it. They'll, they'll work with parents in, in any way they want. But if you'd like to do the course, then, then there's, a, there's a link uh, in, this, in the slide set there and, and just have a look through it. Um, and I, I, I would honestly encourage you to do it because it's useful, but absolutely nobody is, is, is kind of forced to do it at all. It's because it's about supporting families. This is all really about supporting families and children. Um, in terms of, of Hinton, I can um, I can I can make a note uh, and speak with uh, Amy Pitt, who is the lead around talk. In the words of, in the words of Paul Pell, give us your money. Sorry. 
<laughs> so I say again, the words of Bob Goldoff, give us your money. He said something like that. <laughs> Thank you for uh, noting that, Lindsay. Uh, Councillor Summers wanted to ask you a question. Actually, no, Lindsay's done a very good job of it. I just wanted to make a recommendation myself. Uh, I get one of my most useful tools is the Children's Commissioner newsletter I get monthly. Yeah. And there's quite a bit of stuff on that. I'm not sure if anybody else, you, you can just say you want to get it and you'll get it every month and it's very useful. It gives all the, the new stuff that's going on, which our officers probably already know, but our, the councillors very rarely know because we don't tell them. So it's worth looking at. Thanks. And what's that, Councillor Summers, again? It's, it's the Children's Commissioner's Newsletter. Okay. Which uh, we circulated, you're saying. Yeah, I sent it to Jen uh, yeah, you a couple did, weeks ago. Well, you're recommending that we circulate. Yeah, okay. because it's very worthwhile. And it's an up-to-date of what's going on in children. Mm. A lot of what we've talked about today. Thank advice. you. Lindsay, did you finish then? Is that you finished your presentation? I have finished, um, Chair. I, I won't talk about the Public Health Nursing Service, which is our health visiting and school nursing service, uh, but I'm very happy to take any questions on that. There is information in the slide set, um, but I'm very proud of the fact that we commissioned that service, and I think it's a really good service for supporting our families, particularly at a, at a universal level. And your passion and enthusiasm comes over well. I'm glad we gave you at least a chance to talk about it in if not in detail, at least explain the overview to us. I think we need to move on. Any of the councillors online? C Councillor Hay, did you want to say anything on Councillor Fagin before we close this session? Councillor Andrews or Jones, anything you particularly wanted to add? No. I do want to ask something about the public health minister. Is it really up Yes, it's quite. Right, one last question from Councillor Hewitt. So um, I, I've came, come across a problem in my ward with the public health nursing provision in that, um, well, I mean, maybe I need to talk with you directly about it, but it's to do with having the space that they need to work from and, and for the local area to be able to provide it free of charge. And when it was offered at a nominal fee, they said, no, that's not good enough because we don't have any funding to pay for a place for it to be offered. So I have young women in my ward with young children who aren't getting that public health nursing provision into the area and I and I think it's probably I need a more detailed conversation with you about it before I mean it is a matter for scrutiny if there's an issue of oh well you know if you're not going to provide the right accommodation we just won't come which means that then residents aren't provided for does that make sense, Lindsay? If you have that conversation, you should come back to scrutiny. Yeah, let's yeah. make that as a recommendation. Please, if you would, because the service is available across the county to every family in the county. Um, there have been issues, obviously, with clinics and drop-ins um, through, throughout COVID. But if there's an issue like that, then please let me know urgently. Okay, thank, thank you, Lindsay. you. I'll do that. Uh, Councillor Tommy B, before we see if we've got any recommendation, anything you'd like to add as the lead member? Think yes, she's left the meeting. It's Councillor Hay here. Yes, um, okay. Councillor Toynbee had to leave the meeting, unfortunately. I think we do a, a lot of conclusions from the previous session, which overlap into this one, with my feeling. We've got one recommendation that we circulate the newsletter that Councillor Summers has proposed, which we can easily do. Does any councillor wish to add any other recommendation over and above what we've already said we'd like to see acted upon? I think I may have captured one additional recommendation, John, but okay, I'll test that with the committee, that um, Councillor Kenyon recommended that at local government level social media platforms are explored in relation to their impact on the well-being of young people and that the risks presented to young people in being drawn into sexual exploitation and bullying uh, using these platforms being investigated. Councillor Kenyon did recommend that. Kerry, is that something we can plausibly look at and report back on? It is. Yeah. So that would be yeah, an acceptable so. recommendation. It would be an acceptable recommendation. Okay, thank you. So we have two recommendations. It sounds like proposed we accept those. Councillor Hewitt, a seconder. Councillor Jones, all in favour? Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to draw a meeting to a close now, but in doing so, I really would like to thank all the officers particularly. Uh, and it's always difficult, I know, we go over time and we've had a, a pretty mentally stretching afternoon. But as you rightly said, I think it was um, you said, Lindsay, we're here look, looking at Owen oh, and Councillor Kenyon. We are in the interest of our young people that we look after uh, and we've heard some pretty harrowing things today and as you say, Kerry, a lot of it's quite bleak, 
but we are tackling it and making progress and we have a lot of passionate, enthusiastic, committed people clearly from all of you being here. Thank you so much for that commitment to the meeting today, both in the workshop and this afternoon. I think we probably tackled more than we thought we were going to tackle and bit off more than we could chew. We've got through a lot of good material that we've learnt an awful lot and I'm sure it'll inform both improvements and further scrutiny at the next session we look at this subject in September. Thank you all very much again. Can I confirm please that the live recording has been